We are tonight's entertainment. What the fuck is this, Chet? Mm-hmm. This is a tasty burger. Were you rushing or were you dragging? You like Huey Lewis in the news? Is this your homework, Larry? Why you just spill your beans? I am Paul Bordeaux Atreides! Duke of Arrakis! Under the blessing! back we're fucking back that's how it's done dune part two listen all gaib uh, fuck yeah <laughs> <laughs> we're back so i guess we have some explaining to do we do but first i want to do an impression of the guy sitting next to me for dune part two okay <sighs> <laughs> All right, that was my impression. That was great. <laughs> that was perfect. Um, we'll get Fuck in, that guy. We'll get, <laughs> we'll get into <laughs> our, uh, our theater experience uh, in a second once we start talking about Dune. Um, but we're fucking back. Um, I'm sorry for the delay. Here's what happened, all right? At, if you listened to the last scoop, right, we explained we were going on a vacation. Yep. So we were going to miss an episode that week for the vacation. I had thought about recording an extra episode, like some some little mini episode, just to have something to release that Monday while we were gone. Didn't do it. <laughs> we didn't do it. We ran out of Sleeping time. Sleeping on the job. It didn't happen. <laughs> so we just missed the episode last week. I think the first episode we've missed in like six to eight months. Yeah, we've been so, pretty consistent. You know, pat on the back to us. Yeah. I don't want to toot my own horn, but... We've been pretty consistent. All I'm saying was, if if this was a company, we wouldn't get fired. No. You know? No. Sometimes We'd don't. have too much good graces within the company. Exactly. And they, they, they couldn't fire us. Yeah. Um, so, we missed that episode, and then this the day we got back, we got back on a Friday, um, we were sweepy, obviously. Got back at like 8 p.m., 7 p.m. Crazy that night. Crazy drive home. Yeah. like Absolutely in, crazy. Eight hours... Uh, without stopping. So for us, it was like 10 to 11 hours, maybe. I don't know. I feel like we stopped a lot. Anyways, long fucking drive. We were tired. We got Dune 2 tickets for Saturday morning at 11. Watch Dune 2. Had a, had a good time, yep. as one would imagine. And then we saw it again that day at 7 p.m. So we saw it twice that day. And then the day after that, the day I wanted to record the Dune 2 episode, me and Carl got sick. <laughs> simultaneously yeah so I, it was like Sunday it was bad I had a sore throat I was in bed all day didn't want to didn't have any energy I had a headache fucking achy it was it was bad news for me and um so this whole week we've me and Carl like early in the week we had sore throat at least I had a sore throat I don't know if you ever did I had a sore throat for a while yeah. early in the week we had <clears throat> sore throats and then that went away and it trans- transitioned into just like sinus congestion yeah. and we sounded like goddamn Squidward so <laughs> yeah. we just couldn't record an episode like yeah I was tired but one of the days I was like okay we can't record so I'm just gonna go see Dune 2 again because I can't record because I sound dumb right now, but I can still watch a movie. So yeah. I took that time to see it again. So now I've seen it three times. Um, and today is just the first day where we've felt good enough to record and wouldn't sound stupid. Yep. Um, so that's why it took so long. So just a, you know, a big clusterfuck of, of events. bad things. Happen. Yeah. Um, so I apologize for that, for the delay, but... Believe me, I wanted to record it immediately. Yeah. I wanted to come home from my first showing and just record it, but that's not the way that's not the way the cookie crumble, man. Dude, I wanted so. to come home to Timothy Chalamet, like just sitting in the living room, and be like, dude, you see that fucking shit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um I think we've explained ourselves. Yeah. So now first things first, we're gonna talk about Dune Two, but we're going to uh Talk about our watch list and talk about some trivia. Okay. We'll start with the trivia. There is a little bit of news, though. Okay. Uh, a buddy of mine texted me 
Akira Toriyama passed away. The creator, creator of Dragon of Ball. Dragon Ball, which is really sad for me. Mm. That's upsetting. That sucks. So, shout out to the GOAT. Dragon Ball is the shit, dude. Awesome. Never seen it. But I, I saw that announcement, and it said he was 66. Yeah, was I, didn't, like, I didn't realize he was that... Uh, it's pretty young. Young, yeah. yeah. He had to have created Dragon Ball. And he was like pretty... four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool shit. He came up with Dragon Ball in kindergarten. Yeah, he was wearing the orange robes and was like, yeah, dude, whatever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's nothing. Um, yeah, that fucking sucks. Um, but we'll go ahead and get into the trivia. I don't think we missed any news, but who cares? Y'all are adults. <laughs> you can look up the news. Yeah. We don't need, you don't need us sure to tell you're you. you're not like me and you have like Twitter and stuff. Just scroll. Yeah, exactly. Um, you do your trivia first because I always do mine first. So okay. we'll, we'll switch. All right, how many Denis Villeneuve movies have I given five stars on Letterbox? Okay, both Dunes. Yep. Blade Runner, Arrival, Prisoners. I'll just stick with that. You get so, more than that. Is that is that it? Five. That's f- five. Yep, it's five. Awesome. That's how it's done. Did I he, get the correct five, too? It is the correct five. Oh, yeah. He officially has more five-star ratings on my letterbox than Christopher Nolan. Insanity. After Doom 2. Wild, Insanity. Wild stuff. Yeah. All right. Uh, my next one is, how old is Denis Villeneuve? 57. Really close. Really close. He's 56. What? That's what Google told me. Are I'm you his mom. pulling my wiener? I thought I just saw the other day that he was 57. No. Oh. He's 56. All right. Close enough. Fact checking my trivia. Close you enough. Fucking... I think what happened was he was 57, and then the gods saw Doomed Part 2 and they gave him an extra year. Yeah. yeah. They set his clock back a year. They were like, like, you earned this, pal. All right, pal. They reset the, <laughs> the hourglass. Yeah. <laughs> back. From John Wick 4. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um... What is one of Denise's favorite movies? 2001 A Space Odyssey. There you go. That's one of his favorite movies. You really took the Denis trivia literally. Like about like trivia about Denis. I thought that's what you wanted. I did Denis movies. Oh. Well, I mean, one of it's my Denis stuff. Yeah. And then the other two are just questions about Denis as a, as a human. Uh, my but last right. question is... Is Denis trying to get us hard? And if so, what do you? What's his game? What's his plan? I'd say he is. Call me. Hey, <laughs> call me crazy. What's I think he's trying to get us there? hard. What do you think he gets out of that? <laughs> he's got to have some kind of royalties. On he's his got movies, some like, master plan that we can't see yet. It, he gets an extra dollar for each person that leaves his movies with an erection. He's got some fucking plan that once he gets a million penises raised, something's going to happen. Some, I mean, something possibly bad is going to happen. He's got damn near 200 million after doing two. That's what I'm saying. So We're in trouble. I think the doomsday is upon us. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you got? Yeah. Okay. What does Paul Dano's character say to Hugh Jackman's character in the parking lot in Prisoners? I just said it the other day, so you sh- you should get this. <laughs> they only cried after I left them. Yeah. Yep. That was my Paul Dano. Impression. Would you have remembered that if I didn't say it the other day? Yeah, because it's fucking hilarious. <laughs> okay. It's really funny. <laughs> How could he not know? <laughs> yeah. Um... What did Emily Blunt see that gave away John Bernthal's cover in Sicario? That's a hard one because I haven't seen Sicario in forever. Was it the muzzle of his gun? No. I don't know. It's the tie-dye rubber band. Oh, yeah. Um, I almost went with what does Benicio Del Toro say at the end of the movie when he's about to do the deed. Yeah. I'm not going to spoil what happens, but yeah. do the deed. Yeah. Do you remember? I don't. Hmm. I don't remember a lot from Sicario. 
It sounds like a you're an idiot. I, I need don't to know. Watch it. Yeah, you should. I mentioned for some more great cinema. So yeah, anything Denise made really. Yeah, anything will cut it. Yeah. Last one, easy one. What's the name of the Atreides Mintat in Dune? Um, I don't know. Wow. <laughs> Thufir Hawat. Huh? Thufir Hawat. Oh. I think he's only mentioned like once in the entire movie. No. No? <laughs> no, he's in it a lot. I only remember him showing up twice. Once when and then in Oscar... one scene, Paul goes to fear her what? So <laughs> I don't you'd fucking think, remember that? You'd think that would stick with you? No. There's one scene where he goes to fear, and then they hug, and there's one where Oscar Isaac asks him a question, and then his eyes roll back, and he tells him a number, and that's it. He's in. He's in it more than that. They have a meeting. They have a big meeting with him there. What does he say? You're just stupid. All right. What does he just, say in the we'll meeting? Just cut it. I don't you know. tell me what he says in the meeting. Remember? <laughs> he doesn't say anything. Yeah, he does. He says something. <laughs> <laughs> You're being crazy. <laughs> okay. That's what's happening. So, uh, that's all of our trivia. Now we need to get into the old Watchburger. Um, we left off with Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. A while ago. So, uh, after that, I watched Batman Begins. I had to. Gotta do it. What happened was, I <coughs> joined uh, my pal's podcast as a guest the um, Average Film Enjoyer podcast with Trey and Evan. And it was about Batman. It was about the Dark Knight trilogy. Yeah. So Shout out to the homies. Yeah, so I figured I will rewatch Batman Begins, one of my favorite movies. Uh, had a great time. Nice coat. Sweet! <laughs> what, they don't like falafel? <laughs> um, I got a... I needed for uh, spelunking. Uh, so I had a great time and I watched like half of Dark Knight Rises but I didn't log it because I watched half and I'm not a scumbag and yeah. I'm not going to log a movie I watched half of but yeah. just suffice to say I had a great time the half that I watched <laughs> yeah, because it's a great movie um, after that a week later on the cruise one of the movies I downloaded on my laptop was Talladega Nights dude <laughs> That's first what's watch happening. First watch, um, one of the most popular comedies ever, and I liked it. I'm thrilled to hear you say that. I thought for a while you said you just didn't like those type of movies. I didn't realize. Typically, you I don't. I didn't realize you hadn't seen them though. Um, like you hadn't seen Anchorman. At the time that you told me that, I don't think you had seen Anchorman or Talladega Nights. I guess I had just seen clips. I think you'd I only see seen Step context. Um, But, yeah, I watched Anchorman, like, it last year or two years ago, and I thought that was really funny. Yeah. And then I watched Talladega Nights, and it is really funny. Like, most of the scenes I've seen before because of Twitter and YouTube and Instagram and everything, it's just a pop culture movie, but... There still is, are some, like, really funny moments. Yeah. I like the montage of him doing commercials. <laughs> he goes, if you don't chew Big Red, then fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> what a strong... Sing habit. now. Sing now, sing now. <laughs> if I was Big Red, I would have stolen that. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. That's our slogan now. Yeah. Um, it's real. I don't know. It's it's really funny. I mean, you, yeah. you don't need me to tell you that. I love Talladega Nights, dude. Yeah, it's... It's pretty awesome. I love the chemistry with uh, John C. Riley, yeah. and when he's in the hospital and they and he has a he jabs a knife into his leg, and then they put another knife in his leg to try to pry out the other knife. Yeah. <laughs> then, it's really funny. Michael Clark Duncan's like, "I'm gonna cut around it." Yeah, and then yeah. stabbing him over and over. Yeah, and over. yeah, it's funny. <laughs> I can't can't complain at all. I gave it a four. And then on the cruise, they were showing on the big TV. Uh, out at the pool, they were showing Hunger Games, a ballad of songbirds and snakes, which I missed last year, even though people said it was good. I just didn't get to it. I, yeah. I wanted to. And I gave it a three. I thought it was okay. Honestly, after you had told me people liked it a lot, I was surprised after having seen it that people liked it as much as they did. 
Because I didn't really like the movie that much at all. Mm. I think I gave it like a two. Mm. Um, maybe two and a half. I don't remember. But I just thought it was weird. Everything about it was weird. I I think that a like prequel story centered around Snow was a weird idea. Because he's such a despicable character in the Hunger Games movies and in the books. Like, I don't really care That's, enough about I him. I don't agree with that. You don't think despicable characters are worth diving into and find out why why they are the way they are? I guess it just depends on... Darth Vader's a despicable character. They made a whole trilogy about it. I don't think to the extent... I don't think Darth Vader is despicable to the extent that, like, Snow is. Uh, I don't know about that. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Why is that? Darth Vader's a fucking demon. What? He's a fucking... He kills guys, yeah. Snow kills kids. Listen, I'm no Hunger Games expert. I've seen two movies, but... Uh, Darth Vader did some bad shit. <laughs> he just mainly kills people in war. He kills kids after they've, like, in Revenge of the Sith, once they're, ex- like, exploring his character. And his character having this light side to him by the end of the third movie, you know, gives him, like, a redeeming quality. Snow doesn't have that. Snow is evil through and through, through all the Hunger Games movies. I don't know. I feel like that's <clears throat> a weird, like reason to say they shouldn't make a movie like if you don't like it that's fine but i don't i don't see anything wrong with exploring like a prequel on why president snow is the way he is you can say you didn't like the execution and that like oh what, what happened to him enough to make him turn into that guy like if that's your if that's your uh complaint then that's fine too because i'd almost agree I guess it's I guess it's both because like even by the end of the movie, I don't see how he's like why are you why are you blowing up kids in the Hunger Games movies, like, and then on top of that, the tone of the movie is so fucking weird. The music's very out of place. Yeah, in the world that they've built, I don't think the old bluegrass gypsy music really sits well. Yeah. It's, I don't know, it, it feels like a, a fan-made Hunger Games spinoff. Like it doesn't feel like a real mm. Hunger Games thing. And then, like I said, by the end of the movie, the events that take place don't really, like, show me at all, like, oh, that's the snow I know from the Hunger Games, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, when you watch the movie, it's like, what really happened to this guy? that like would turn someone evil basically someone broke up with him <laughs> yeah that's it he did something bad <clears throat> and then this girl was like oh you did something bad i'm leaving <laughs> and then that's kind of the movie she said you rascal yeah you devil and she left and then he was like well time for genocide I mean, <laughs> like i don't know it's a big jump to make but anyway like, this is nothing but a uh, hoot nanny and then yeah. ran off into the woods yeah <coughs> um so I, I wasn't a huge fan but i also didn't think it was terrible um it looked cool at times had some good production value and the performance is really good so i gave I it did, a three i, I didn't did hate like it snow's little outfit though the the dress pants combo is yeah fucking all blood cold, red dude yeah cold Pete, as ice. you got the peter dinklage tax too yeah and then he's like you get an extra half point snow always lands on top i was like yeah Hell what yeah. is this a marvel movie <laughs> yeah dude, you have a catchphrase yeah uh yeah that's rough that's rough stuff um then on the drive home on the old phone i watched her hell yeah rewatch you finally got it to work yeah dude that was so weird that was so <laughs> weird i downloaded her on my phone and I got halfway through, and then it froze. And listen, I'm not, I'm not an idiot with technology. I know what to do when things freeze. I know how to fix that. Yeah. You restart the app. You restart your phone. There's many different things you can do to fix things. I did everything. I restarted my phone. <laughs> I restarted the app. And how a downloaded movie, it wasn't like I 
I was it was half downloaded and then I left the house and it never finished downloading. It was fully downloaded. And it was pausing at one spot in the movie no matter what I did. That's crazy. It was I've never seen anything like What'd it. Would you have to do delete it and then re-download it? No, I had to wait till uh I had cell reception. Oh my god. I had to wait till we got back in Florida and like I wasn't on airplane mode anymore. Jeez. Yeah. It was crazy, but I eventually ended up finishing it. Gave it a four and a half. It's fucking awesome. It's absolutely fucking awesome. Spike Jones is a dog. Um, Joaquin Phoenix is a stud. I found out recently that they originally had an, another voice actor uh, playing like the AI. Mm-hmm. And then they got Scarlett Johansson like alarmingly late. In like before uh, the release of the movie to like dub over it and replace that girl. I think I want to say I read it was like three weeks before release. <laughs> Holy fuck, dude! Yeah, talk about a a jump. Yeah, so that's that's crazy. But I do think that was the right call. I think Scarlett Johansson's voice works really well for that uh, movie. She does have a pretty hot voice, dude. Yeah, and because she also has a very un AI voice. Yeah, it's very. It doesn't sound like Alexa or anything. It, it, yeah, it feels very real, which was like very needed for the story they were telling. Yeah, to try and to try and blur those lines a little. Yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, I like her. I like her a lot. Yeah, hers awesome. Um, next day, watch Dune Part Two twice. We'll get into it. Um, day after that, I watched a documentary about Yodorovsky's Dune. Ooh. You don't know what that is, do you? I don't. But so, the documentary is interesting. So, back in the 70s, a director named Alejandro Yodorovsky wanted to make a Dune movie. And there were, had been no Dune movies. This was before David Lynch, so it was, like, just a book. And, um... And so he went around and like got a crew together and like found a cinematographer and found someone. He found H.R. Geiger who did the. Uh, I don't know exactly what you call it, the, but like uh, I know who Geiger is, like the artwork that inspired Alien. And stuff. Yeah, he did the Alien artwork basically. Yeah. So he didn't like. I don't think he like by hand creates the monsters, but he designs the monsters. You know that you see yeah. in, in yeah. Alien. Um, his his work is like inspired. It's a lot crazy of stuff. Yeah, it's yeah, really wild. Yeah, so he got like this. He went around finding like the perfect crew to uh, make Dune because it was a very ambitious project. But uh, it never <clears throat> ended up getting made for a lot of reasons. Uh, he first of all, it cost too much cost too yeah. much money he wanted to do things that like weren't really possible he wanted to do things that wouldn't really be possible to do well today and he was trying to do them in the 70s what do you want to harvest a sandworm like he wanted his opening shot to be uh a pan in from outside of the universe the camera pans in into the universe and like passes by planets until you get to Dune, and then you and then you zoom in on Dune all the way down to like one person on Dune. Holy shit! In one take, oh my! All God. the way from the outside of the universe to Dune, Damn. not possible. Yeah. Unless you have millions and millions and millions of dollars of CGI money and a lot of time. Yeah. And he didn't have money. He didn't have the money to do it. Um, and the technology, even if he did have the money back then, it would have looked like shit. So, he also, like, changed so much about the book. Um, I mean, I guess I can kind of talk about stuff he changed. Because it's not like a spoiler, because this is his made-up version. If I say, like, in in his version of Dune, this happens, that doesn't spoil anything for normal Dune. Yeah, yeah. So, at the end of his Dune, first of all, Dune is a cautionary tale about messianic figures. Yeah. It's not a a hero's journey. Yeah. And he just made it a hero's journey. He took out all of Frank Herbert's stuff about it being a cautionary tale. Yeah. And about um, Paul having a terrible purpose and just made Paul the man 
He just made him <laughs> Dude, God. This is the coolest guy yeah. in the world. And he cast his son as Paul. Fuck. Yeah, yeah. dude. Um, and course. at the end of the movie, of Paul dies. And everyone around him, like the, the Fremen and Stilgar and everybody, uh, they all start saying, I am Paul. You're describing to me. <laughs> <laughs> You're describing to me one of the best movies that could have been made in history. Dude, he made him, he made Paul God. Like, (laughs) I am Paul. The end of the movie was like a big fuck you to the Harkonnens because they killed, like, the person that they wanted to kill. And then everyone on Dune was like, that didn't mean anything. Like, he's already, we already are him and he's already us. His name was Robert Paulson. Yeah, his name was Robert Paulson. What a fucking crazy guy, dude. Yeah. Um it's it's re- like I'm not even scratching the surface on the stuff he changed. Like he changed everything about it. He wanted to cast Mick Jagger as Fade Rautha. No, of course. He cast Orson <clears throat> Welles as the Baron. The director, Orson Welles, the big fat guy. <laughs> I mean, the Baron is a fat guy. So, it fits. It's absolutely ridiculous, everything he wanted to do. And he was a very my way or the highway type of director. Wow. And he yes. didn't let any studios tell him what, uh, like, give him any input on anything. So, that's one of the reasons it never got made was because no studios wanted to work with him because he's an asshole. Yeah. And he's... What's so crazy is, like, he met with this one guy who was the man of practical effects at the time. He was, like, the top guy for practical effects. Yeah. And he went to him, and then Yodorovsky said, oh, I talked to him, but then I left because he was so full of himself. And he was so, he thought he was so important. And then I was like, that that's what you've been, that's what you yeah. are. That's yeah. what you've been doing this whole time. And... It, so it, it was weird him like critiquing someone for being full of themselves and that's all he is is yeah. full of himself and he was like filmmaking is about dreaming and you shouldn't let anyone tell you what to dream you told I was like are you do you dream. live on another planet like what do you <laughs> filmmaking is an art yes but it's also a business and studios are trying to make money yeah. and your movie has no demographic there's yeah. no amount there's no person that's gonna like this you're making this movie for like 11 people and that's not gonna make the studio money so no yeah. they're not giving you 15 million dollars <throat> in 1970 that's fucking crazy which is dude. probably like a hundred million dollars now like yeah. a ton of money to make a movie that no one would have liked yeah and so i enjoyed watching the documentary but i don't some people claim the movie as like the best movie never made. I know Nicholas Winding Refn said he, he went to Yodorowsky's house and like, he's got a huge thick book of the entire movie, like frame by frame. He storyboarded the entire thing and it's massive. And he, he showed it all like every single frame to Nicholas Winding Refn. And he said it, it was like awesome, but that's a weird guy too. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, he made only a- God forgive. So I don't know if I really trust him. He's a little weird. Um, so yeah, I, I'm really glad it didn't get made (laughs) because that may have ruined the perception of Dune in like the public's eye. If, if he would have made that, uh, I don't know. Cause this, I'm telling you, like, I didn't see the documentary, but it's hard for me to contemplate a movie worse than the, um, old Dune. Well, you don't need to contemplate it. It was this would have been worse. Just watch the documentary. They show you storyboards, they show you character designs. He tells you about the story. It's horrible. <laughs> it's absolutely horrible. And he's talking about it like like it's his thing. Like he's talking about this dude movie like it's his baby. And you would think it's like this guy is like George Lucas talking about Star Wars or James Cameron talking about Avatar, things they created. 
Yeah. He didn't create this. This is Frank Herbert's work. Yeah. You're just adapting it and making it stupid. That's You're just crazy. making it bad. But he had such like <clears throat> I don't I don't know. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of that guy. I haven't seen any of his movies. Um but they're really weird. They show you clips of his movies in the documentary and they're fucking weird and I don't want to watch them and I'm glad his movie didn't get made and uh, he's pretentious and fucking he makes he makes David Lynch's dude movie like look all right. Oh shit. Dude. That's how I that's how I feel about it. That's crazy. Yeah. Um so yeah, I watched that just cuz I was in a dune mood and <clears throat> Just dooning just, around. Yeah. Ah. You know. <laughs> and then uh, next day I watched Dune 2 again. As one does. Got to. Part 3. Um, and then last night, not last night, two nights ago, we watched David Lynch's Dune. Yes, sir. Yes, we're, sir. We did We did watch that. We I just figured it. it would make for good, uh, something good, like Dune-related content to talk about on the pod and... Everyone talks about it all the time, so figured it might as well be a good time. Dune two coming out. Yeah. Um. I have it, some thoughts on it, <laughs> dude. It is so. I I haven't read the book, so maybe it's less bizarre than how it actually looks to me. But to me, that was the weirdest fucking shit I've ever seen in my life. So. Here's what I'll say. I don't like this movie. I gave it a one and a half star. I think it's bad. Okay. But David Lynch did have an impossible task. Yeah. So there's no world where like you make Dune, the whole book of Dune, one movie, and it's good. Not possible. It is impossible. You need two movies. Really... It'd be best as like a mini series. Like yeah. the way Dune should be told is probably like a Game of Thrones style show. But um because even Denis has to cut out a lot in his movies. So if he could get like an eight hour mini series, like eight hour eight one hour episodes, that would probably be best case scenario. But uh You've got an impossible task adapting a 600-page book into a two-hour movie with 1984 technology and uh, studio interference. Yeah. So, it's not possible for this movie to be good. I'll just say that. So, in David Lynch's defense, like, it's bad, but I would expect nothing else under yeah. these circumstances. Um, but there are some moments that are really cool, and there's some good practical effects. I liked the the scene, the first worm scene when it uh, eats the carry all. Yeah, dude, the worm. It's pretty awesome. The worms didn't look bad. Yeah, that was like the highlights of the movie for me was when it got to, like no CGI and it was just like old school David Lynch practical effects. Yeah, and there's some there's some cool stuff and uh, I'd say like that's kind of. The only good stuff for me. Yeah, I'd say so too. There was just so much like, there was some stuff you pointed out that was like from the book, like that. Uh, what was it? A something guide. The guild navigators. Guild navigator, and you're like, oh, there's a guild navigator, and I, I saw it. It happened, and I still have no idea what the fuck that is. So I, guild navigators are like they at the beginning of the first Denise Dune. They say that spice is needed for interstellar travel. Yes. But they don't go in, in depth to that, but they just say that. Uh, the guild navigators are who do interstellar travel, and they're who need the spice. Oh, okay. So spice production is very important to them because it's how they uh, are able to see... Basically, they're able to see what's ahead of them in space so they can do interstellar travel. Okay. Um, that makes sense because the little guy in the box was like omniscient almost. Yeah. So they're a decently big part of Dune, the book, and they're not in Denise at all because he just doesn't have room. There's some things he just doesn't have room for in, um, in his movies. And they're slightly weird and kind of hard to 
hard to adapt without seeming goofy. So there is some cool stuff that you don't get to see in Denise movies like the Guild Navigators. But for me, it's this movie is has some of the most insane pacing I have ever seen in my life. What this movie feels like is it feels like a 10 hour miniseries was made and then someone made a YouTube compilation called David Lynch's Dune Best Scenes Compilation. Yeah. It feels like a two hour compilation of the best scenes of a 10 hour miniseries. Yeah. Because it's like, think about every big moment from Dune, like every pivotal moment, like, um, the Atreides uh, taking over Arrakis, and uh, and then the carryall getting eaten, and then the Harkonnen attack, and then they're stuck in the desert, and all that stuff. It's like every five minutes, there's a new major plot point happening. Yeah, and you don't get any time to breathe. You don't you don't really care about anything that's happening because it, it's like you're fast forwarding through a story. Yeah, and um, like I said, David Lynch can't really help that. Like it's impossible to tell a story that grand in that amount of time. Um, but that's just how it feels. Like I, I don't, I love the story of Dune and I couldn't give two shits about anything happening in the movie because it moves incredibly too fast. Yeah. So, uh, they also, also did that weird, um, like hearing people's thoughts and it would have been fine if it was just Paul's thoughts but, like, they did it for a lot of different characters. Right. So, in the book, that's how it is. In the book, it's told from an omniscient perspective. And you, you, you'll hear uh, Stilgar's thoughts. And you'll hear Jessica's thoughts and Paul's thoughts. And it's just that whole book. You're always hearing what people are saying versus what they're thinking. Um, but guess what? This isn't a book. This is a movie. And you have to change things. And some things work for books and not movies. And it's... It infuriated me hearing yeah. not only because it's I mean it's just lazy like it's a lazy stupid way to get information across to the audience by just having characters say their thoughts yeah. and every time they said it basically it wasn't anything important either there was yeah. one time we were watching the water of life scene yeah. and he saw his mom taking it, and then he, Paul said to the audience in his head, I'm going to have to do this one day. <laughs> That's what he said. Yeah. What the fuck is that? What are, why did the audience need to know that? Yeah. And then, uh, was it when he was fighting Gurney, he was like, Gurney's not holding back, or, or Gurney's not faking this. Yeah. Like, just show them fighting. Yeah. They'll get the fucking memo. Yeah. Uh, just sp- hand holding dude it's some of the worst hand holding i've seen from a movie ever yeah. like nothing is left up to interpretation yeah paul, you are spoon fed everything paul calls arrakis the desert planet dude his dreams yeah. are so he's like, funny arrakis. he's he's sleeping and he's tossing and turning in his sleep and he goes dude desert planet arrakis <laughs> yeah like who, what? Who does that? Why are you calling it all their different names? Yeah. It's it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. So I don't I think it's bad and I think some things are David Lynch's fault and some things aren't. Um I don't mind the old practical the old CGI that's dated that looks like shit. You can't help that really. Like yeah. it, it's okay. Like I don't I don't mind that. I mind the hand holding and the over explanation of everything. And the pacing is yeah. just god awful. So, um, yeah, I'm not a fan. But it's got a cool poster. It does have a really cool poster. Yeah. I saw the uh, steelbook for it once, and I was like, "Oh, dude, this is sick!" And then I was like, "Oh, it's bad." Yeah, yeah, it's got a cool Arrow video release. Um, and then last night, still not feeling the best. So I skipped the gym and watched Monsters Inc. Ooh, there we go. And first things first, Monsters Inc. is awesome. 
Take, no, no one's band aid on. No one's dude. pulling your leg here. Yeah. It's awesome. I'm not trying um, to lead you down the primrose path yeah. on this one. <laughs> You're gonna make him lose his focus. <laughs> um, but there's two things I noticed about it that I wasn't really a fan of, and that is a when uh, they get swindled by their boss, they get thrown out into the snow. Mr. Waternoose. Yeah, the wa- Waternoose. Yeah. Yeah. They find the abominable snowman. They're in the cave. And then Sully's like, all right, I'm heading out. I've got to go find Boo. She's in trouble. And then Mike turns on him and says, like, we. And then he's like, I'm staying right here. And, like, we're not cool anymore, basically, is what happened. That was the scene. And so Sully leaves. He, in the next scene, he shows up back in uh, headquarters because he snuck in through a kid's bedroom. And... It's the next... I'm, I'm not joking. It's the next scene. From when we just saw them get mad at each other and Mike stay there and Sully leave. The next scene, Mike shows back up and they're friends again. That's insane. That's, that's men, men being dudes, dude. That's absolutely ridiculous. You're, you're creating drama that you instantly back out of. <laughs> that you instantly reverse. Yeah. Like, not even... If it could have just been like 15, 20 minutes later, Mike shows back up and he's like, ah, I thought about it. Sorry. We're cool now. Yeah. I can accept that. The next scene, Carl. That's crazy. <laughs> you know I've never funny? seen anything like it. When you were telling me about that, I knew exactly the scene you were talking about. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> he gets <him. laughs> he, he, he shows up in the, in the next scene. Yeah. It's crazy. So I don't like that. I don't like backing out of thing you know decisions that you make that quickly um and then at the end they send boo back home and they say goodbye and it's all sad and then my and then sully looks down at his clipboard and he sees the drawing that she drew of him and her and then the little piece of wood from the door yeah and i was like oh that's sweet should have ended right there that's how the movie should have ended but instead they once again back out and Mike reconstructs Boo's door and then the ending of the movie is Sully walking back in to Boo's room and she and she goes ah! or whatever she makes a kid noise point is she says kitty yeah get your fucking facts straight dude. point is they instantly backed out of the emotional scene of Sully leaving Boo and it, he just goes back and he's like alright I'm back five minutes later woo don't do that. The movie should have ended with Sully looking down at his clipboard, seeing the piece of wood, and saying, like, ah, like, I miss her, but, you know, it's for the best. And, you know, I am a big monster, and she's a kid, so she should probably just, like, go back to her normal life. And uh, But we had some good times, didn't we? <clears throat> That's how it should have ended. I, I hate the last shot of the movie, like, backing out of everything you just did. So, still a four and a half, still a banger, still an absolute steamer, um, but, you know, yeah, it's just my thoughts. I get the, the mic thing, um, I, I like the ending to Monsters, Inc. a lot, but, a little too you know much. something that happens, I'm pretty sure it happens at the end of, in the Monsters, Inc., but, should I wish still happened? Hmm. If I'm not mistaken, I mean, a lot of the old Pixar movies do it. I know Toy Story does, but they used to animate... Bloopers? Bloopers yeah. that they played at credits. First it, of all... They don't do it in Monsters, Inc., but I know what you're talking yeah, about. Bring back bloopers... In general. In credits. Yeah. Full stop. That's Bottoms it. did it. Bottoms did do it. Yeah, and that was awesome. I think before Bottoms, the last movie I saw that did it was like Rush Hour. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Why do we yeah. stop doing that? Yeah. You got the footage. Yeah. Show me some laughs. But Make, Pixar making bloopers is funny. That's crazy. Yeah. Like writing, voice acting, and animating bloopers. Yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. I love that, dude. Yeah. They do it for like every Toy Story. It's so good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, four and a half. Banger. <clears throat> Just had some things I noticed about it that I didn't like. No problem. Um, so, I guess it's fucking time. Well, I watched some stuff. Oh, okay. It's I not watched, time yet. <laughs> I watched 
Dirty Work, mm. which is a 90s comedy with Norm MacDonald. Loved it. I thought it was hilarious. I really like Norm MacDonald's comedy. He's not for everybody. I'm beginning to understand. But I thought it was really funny. And I had a good time. Mm. I think it's a a hidden gem of a movie. Like I don't really Mm. hear a lot of people talking about dirty work um, a lot. So I think it's pretty sick. Um, And then I I watched Animal House today. People love Animal House. Not as funny as I would have expected it. I've seen it before, and I remember thinking it was funny, but watching it now, it's not quite as funny. Hmm. So I know nothing about it. Yeah, it was, it was a little bit... There's a pretty fucked up scene that happens. Oh? That occurs. Um, I won't spoil anything, but it's... Definitely wouldn't get made today, I can tell mm, you that. <laughs> I see. And then I, I watched Spaceman... With Adam Sandler, the Netflix movie, mm. Adam Sandler and Paul Dano. And that was, I don't really know how to feel about Space Man. It looked great, and I liked what they were doing, but I just don't know, I don't know if I felt like the emotional charge that I should have given the situation, you know what I mean? Mm. Right. Um, Space Man is a... Uh... I don't know how to say this. Spaceman is kind of a ripoff of something that I really like, but I can't say what it's a ripoff of because it would be a spoiler if I said it was a ripoff of something, which I know sounds confusing. I trust you. But I can't say what it, what it's a spoiler of, but it's it's like it's a blatant ripoff of something and I don't like that, so I'm not going to watch it. Oh, I haven't seen it's what is a ripoff of? No. Oh. No. Dang. Yeah. Now I want to watch what the original one was. Well, now I, I can't tell you, because then you'll know. You'll know. Well, you tell, tell me after the podcast. We won't spoil it for the No, podcast. I'm saying, like, I can't tell you what I'm saying it's a spoiler of. Oh, you can tell me. It's fine. No, because I want you to experience that thing like I did. I don't oh. want you to know that there's blah, blah, blah in it. Oh, okay. So. God, that must be a huge ripoff. Yeah. <laughs> Spaceman was a book, though. Was it? Yeah. Pretty sure. Do you remember his name in, in Spaceman? Jakob. Okay. Just making sure it wasn't. Yeah, Jakob. Something. Okay. Anyways, yeah. Way, way too similar to something I love, and I don't want to. I don't want to watch that. Dang, so that sucks. Yeah, I'm sure the the one you're talking about's better though, because I w- I'd probably give Spaceman like a maybe a three. Mm. Yeah. Yep. That's not bad though. It's not bad, but I I don't know. I teeter between a two and a half and a three because I don't see myself ever rewatching it. There he is. A slutty little umbrella. <laughs> he is kind of kind of hoeing around with that umbrella, dude. <laughs> He's trying to draw draw men's gaze. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I teetered around like a two and a half to a three on Spaceman just because I don't see myself ever rewatching it. Um, but I also like Adam Sandler. Mm, I love Adam Sandler. He's so fucking good, dude. Yeah. I'd go two and a half on it. I'll, okay. I'll take it down to half star. Two and a half on Spaceman. That's all you got? Yeah, that was it. Um... Oh, Jesus Christ, dude! You just break your leg? Yeah, I broke my leg. Um, <sighs> forgot to mention on the cruise, I had no Wi-Fi, so I did a lot of reading, and Carl did some reading too. But I read um, *The Catcher in the Rye*, which is apparently something a lot of kids read in school, but I didn't. So I read it on my own. Did it make you want to assassinate a president? You mean John Lennon? Was it John Lennon? Yeah. I don't know. There's so much crazy shit, dude. <laughs> Some guy, like, was obsessed with um, Jodie Foster and tried to kill someone, and then someone read Catcher in the Rye and tried to kill someone. It all yeah. runs together. Catcher in the Rye, the guy said Catcher in the Rye made him want to kill John Lennon, and he killed John Lennon. Did you get any vibes? No. 
I don't know what that guy was smoking. Did they mention John Lennon once? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. What the fuck? John Lennon dude. wasn't even a thing when that what book was written. What a crazy leap. Catcher in the Rye is about a kid that gets kicked out of his boarding school. So, but he doesn't want to go home to his parents because they're going to yell at him. So he just walks around New York City for a night and wanders around and meet and has interactions with with crazy people. I don't know, dude. Now I kind of want to kill the guy. <laughs> dude, it's I don't know what that That's guy was, a, what was a talking psycho, about. Dude. Yeah. Um, but it's got a <laughs> it, the book has a good sense of humor about it, like crazy. Uh, like you would think a a book written in the fifties, what was funny in the fifties would not be funny today. Yeah, but it's almost like it was ahead of its time because it has a not as crazy, but like it sort of has an American Psycho kind of comedy about it. Holy cow! Um, and not as dark, but it's like the comedy style of hearing someone's thoughts and them rambling about dumb shit. Yeah, and uh. I don't want to talk too much about like uh, spoilers or like what the book is and the things I noticed about it, but it's it can be really funny though. Like at the beginning of the book, he's in a he's in a dorm he's in like a dorm room basically with mm-hmm. a roommate, and he, <laughs> he he calls his roommate a moron, and then he's instantly like morons hate it when you call them morons. And, <laughs> Shit like that yeah. throughout the whole book. And he has a very repetitive vocabulary. He'll say, God damn, in like every sentence. And he'll yeah. sometimes say it in multiple times in the same sentence. That's and funny. he's like, he hates movies for some reason. So he's like, and the one that there's nothing I hate more than those goddamn movies. Those goddamn phony actors with the in the goddamn movie theater with the goddamn popcorn. And Jesus. like... It's it's very unique and like it, it can be really funny at times. He's um, like Robert De Niro with the You motherfucking fucking motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the motherfucking fucker who calls the shots. I'm the motherfucking <laughs> fucker who calls the shots. <laughs> um oh, but yeah, it, I mean I enjoyed it, but it, it wasn't anything like crazy that I'd say everyone needs to read or anything, but it's it was cool. Um but then I read Project Hail Mary, which Holy fucking shit. Yeah. Holy dick balls. <laughs> that level. Everybody needs to read Project Hail Mary. Oh my it god. It is dude. ridiculous. It's it, the second I finished it, it was my second favorite book ever behind Dune. Oh my god. And honestly, the reason I love Dune so much is probably just because of Denis Villeneuve's movies. I think that factors a lot into it. I think if I read Dune and read Project Hail Mary with no movies attached, I'd probably prefer Project Hail Mary. But Holy mackerel. The movies are attached, so that's factored in for me. When I read yeah. the book, I'm thinking about Denis yeah. Villeneuve's Dune. Anyways, um, Project Hail Mary is fucking awesome. And it's like 472 pages, and I read it in three days. Jeez, dude. Which, for me, is ridiculous yeah i mean that's over that's like 150 pages a day for three days straight um absolutely nuts a nuts book um that i'm not gonna spoil the synopsis or anything carl asked me what it was about and i i don't know what to say because it's one of those books that like from the opening word of the book it's mysterious like you're piecing together what's going on chapter by oh, chapter. I gotcha. So I don't w- even want to say like what the overarching, like don't read the back of the book. No. The, but the back of the book will tell you a lot more than you should know. Okay. So like, just go in, read it. And, uh, it's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. I loved it. And supposedly we're getting a movie adaptation by Christopher Miller and Phil Lord starring Ryan Gosling. Oh my God, dude. So, boy am i excited <laughs> if that if that actually like comes true they apparently they're starting filming in june but i'm a i'm a very uh i'll believe it when i see it type of guy yeah so um hopefully that gets made because holy fucking shit that book is amazing everyone go read it and now i'm trying i'm still trying to finish children of dune 
not the ongoing <laughs> challenge. Not my favorite thing in the world. Um, but apparently, God Emperor of Dune is great. So I've been trying to push through Children of Dune. I've got the book and I've got the audio book. So when I'm at work, I listen to the audio book. Um, and I've got like a little over seven hours left on the audio book. So I'm like getting close to finishing. And then hopefully I can dive right into God Emperor because apparently it's the tits. Heck yeah. But anyways, I think that's I think that's all I read on the cruise. Yeah, I'm gonna read um, Project Hail Mary once I finish Dracula. Mm. I keep forgetting to play uh, the audiobook on my way to work in the mornings mm. because I got quite the drive. Mm. So I could, I could get through most of the book, like in like you can get through like th- almost three hours of the audiobook a day if yeah. you listen to it there and back. Yeah, that's a lot. So <laughs> I could probably. F- Finished Dracula audiobook just listening to it on my way to and from work for like two or three days. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm about like halfway through it now. Damn. Yeah. Pretty I gave awesome. it the business, dude. I gave it the old fucking... <laughs> yeah, I gave it that little number right <laughs> <laughs> on the way uh On the way home from the cruise. Mm, hell yeah. That's how you do it. That's how it's done. Um, so that's all we, all we needed to discuss. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. So I guess we can go ahead and get into Dune Part 2. Let's get to the meat and potatoes. Listen al gaib! Listen al gaib! So, first things first, theater experience. Um, Like Carl mentioned earlier, there was this fella. Um, first of all... Hey, let's... So before the movie started, they were playing trailers, right? And they, play, they played... They played a trailer one? for... Huh? Oh no! This you're talking about the first movie experience. Yeah, I was talking about the second one. I'm talking about the I, first one. Okay, the first one. There was they showed the trailer for Twisters, and there was this guy behind us. The trailer ends and it says July something, July Fourth or something. Yeah. This guy behind us. The theater's dead silent. No one's saying a word. The trailer just ended. The music stopped. It's switching over to another trailer, and he, this guy goes. <laughs> July <laughs> I wish I was joking about the tone that's exactly how he sounded yeah. for those of you listening it's a perfect it's a perfect impression of this fucking <laughs> lunatic dude he wanted to watch Twisters like his life depicted on it. <laughs> that was two of T if you blindfolded me <laughs> and you had cash do that, I'd be like, no, that's the guy. That's the guy that said it. So he did that. And then so we're watching the movie. We're watching Dune Part 2. And we're in the middle of a very uh, important scene, but also like a very quiet scene. And this guy, the same guy, the July guy, we can hear him behind us, dead silent in the middle of a dialogue scene. And he goes... I gotta go to the bathroom. (laughs) And then starts squeezing his way through the aisle to get to leave. Oh my god, you killed me. I'm like, so not only are you getting in these people's way, are you blocking the screen for these gentlemen that are trying to watch a great movie? Yeah. You have to announce it to everyone. Yeah. What planet are you on, my man? (laughs) Dude, he's... He's definitely not on a rack. Are you okay, you that, son? Dude. Like, what's happening right now? So he wants to be on the planet that Twisters is on. That's yeah. what he wants. <laughs> that man really wanted to watch Twisters. Yeah. Um. So we had that happen, which was uh, not fun. Also, um, I don't know if you guys have dads, but I have a dad, and my dad's ringtone is uh, it's. How, do, how would you, it's a piano, and it goes down, 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 down. Yeah, down, 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 down. <laughs> and there's a lot of old people that have that same ringtone for some reason. It is big. If you're, if it's you're a over, huge hit with the geezers. If you're over 45, you're like, fuck yeah, dude. <laughs> when, you, <laughs> when you play that, you're, you're like, fucking God, bless me. Yeah. <laughs> you hear that shit, Janet? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> that ringtone happened in the middle of Dune. I don't know who it was. 
But someone yeah. had someone didn't if you mute have their a phone. Roth IRA. That shit fucking drives you nuts when you hear it. Dude. You definitely have open-toed sandals that <laughs> yeah. you wear when you go yeah. camping. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that that happened. Um. Other than that, it was a pretty good pretty good audience for all three of my ventures into the old Dune Dune yeah. Burger. But let's start talking about the movie. Well, I, hang on. I think is what needs to happen before we jump in. I do have a confession to make. I just want the people to know. I had to use the bathroom during Dune 2. That was crazy. During the our first viewing of Dune 2. First viewing. And I was sitting there, and I was like, dude, I don't want to walk away, but I really got to pee. So I declined my seat. I was like, all right, we're good. I had on new jeans, put on the old Sunday best for <laughs> For Dune 2. Had on newer jeans tied around the old waist. Right. Compressing the bladder. Yep. Where the urine is stored. Mm-hmm. And I was like, fuck, dude, I gotta pee so bad. I started sweating, started getting hot. I was like, I'm going, I, I gotta go pee. So I waited till what I thought would be the least amount of stuff missed. Got up, sped past these people beside me in the theater. I stepped on a lady's bag on accident. Don't care. I'm trying to get out of there. Run down the aisle. Run back. And, of course, the part I miss is fucking insane. I won't say anything, but you know the part I missed. What? This is a Dune 2 episode. You can... What do you mean? Oh, we're doing spoilers? Yeah. Oh, okay. Of course, the part I miss is <laughs> uh, Fade kissing the dude, the, the Baron on the lips. <laughs> Aggressively, yeah. He kisses him once, and then, and then he goes in for back and was like, "What are you fucking son of a bitch?" And then gives him the business. You pick him a horrible time. Gives him another what for? And then <laughs> puts his hand up, and everyone's like, "Yeah, fuck you, yeah, dude." You were better off missing the fight at the end, yeah, than missing that. Yeah, you can't miss that. Yeah, people cheered. You're like, dude, you kissed the fuck out of your uncle, dude. <laughs> That's what I want to see. Yeah. So. Okay, yeah, I, I did want to bring up the fact that Carl peed during Dune 2. That was yeah, just not okay. <laughs> just not an okay thing to do. I'm getting old, dude. I used to be able to hold my piss for so long. And now my fucking... Dude, well, I, like when, I, when big movies like this come out, I'm very careful about what I consume before before said screening. I thought I was. I thought I was too. I, I peed beforehand. And I drank like a, peeing like, beforehand, I I, and then still peeing in the middle of the movie is crazy. I know, that's I know. crazy. But I slammed my monster because I had a fucking rough day, so I slammed my monster and just had to pee again. I'm getting old, dude. My fuck farts come slapping out of my ass. When dude, I you know what's crazy it. is like I used to have a reputation of being uh, a high volume pooper. Yeah, I used to take a lot of poos, <laughs> a lot of shits. Um, and I've noticed now that, like, I can hold my everything. Like, I can hold peas and poos in very easily now. Like, you've built up, you've built up a dude, I, endurance. Like, it's like, I'll wake up. Sometimes I have a healthy breakfast. Sometimes I go crazy. Go to McDonald's. Get two bagels. Yeah. Because they have a deal. Two bagels? Because they have a deal where you get, buy a breakfast sandwich, you get one for a dollar. Holy cow, Crazy dude. deal because breakfast sandwiches are like five bucks, yeah. six bucks. So you got to take that deal. <laughs> I take that deal every time. Yeah. So I get two bagels and pound them down. No problem. Go to work. Like, so I haven't pooped yet. And then I'll eat more food at work and like my lunch. And then still haven't pooped. And then I'll be at home. It's like five o'clock and I'm like, I haven't shit today. And I, maybe some people consider that a bad thing. But for me, going my whole life, pooping every 15 minutes, this is a great thing. And, like, I'm never thinking about pooping during movies or peeing or anything. It's like I, I can just hold it in. Like I never I, have to worry about pooping during movies um, except for that one time that I think I ate something that didn't agree very well with the old gun. You, I remember you leaving during Doctor Strange 2. That's the first time. During the music fight. That's the first time in human history that I've walked out of a movie because of poo. I've didn't walked you, out of movies because they've been bad. Didn't you do something during the Batman? No. 
During one of the screenings, I think you did. Maybe during one of them. But not... I don't think it was opening night. But I but. still don't even remember doing, doing anything doing anything for one of them. Mm. It's pretty rare, but... Uh, uh, I, I'll get crazier depending on the movie about, like, what I eat beforehand. If we're going to see, like, uh, like the beekeeper, I'll eat some... I eat some Chick Fil A beforehand. Yeah, no big deal. If I if I if he poops, he poops. You know. Yeah. But like doing two, I fasted. Like I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not putting anything in my body. Yeah. That could make me, that could make my stomach hurt, make me poop, anything. I yeah. I need a clean slate for doing two. Nothing. I take I take Advil on my way to the theater just in case I get a headache. <laughs> I don't even have one. I just yeah. take it just in case I get one. I've already got two Advils in the dome ready yeah. to fight it off. Yeah, you're impervious to all. <laughs> to all. You can take on all comers. <laughs> all the way to watch Dune. But yeah, that was that was crazy. Yeah, I'm usually pretty good about it. Yeah, you 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 are good about holding pee. I hear you in the morning sometimes. You unload a lot of, <laughs> dude, a lot of urine too. I piss for a long time. <laughs> you're in there for. I think, like. <laughs> Two minutes straight. Yeah, two minutes to just stream. stream. Hard stream. Not yeah. dribbling out, but just yeah. full blast. Yeah. Fire hydrant, dude. Yeah, I drink a lot of water. Yeah. I think that's that's why it happens. It's good. You're a healthy young lad. Ah. Anyway, to, back to Dune 2. <laughs> also, real quick, before we get into Dune 2, I heard that uh, apparently diet drinks are causing a 20% uh, increase in people's... Um, probability of having an irregular heartbeat holy shit so thinking about laying off the diet drinks because i don't want that to happen that is that's crazy because it's like what the fuck's in those i don't know it's fucking with your heart yeah i don't want things fucking with my heart yeah so you know maybe i'll just start drinking like i don't drink many sodas or anything often but i think when i do i'm just gonna start getting normal soda with like because at least it's natural sugar that they're putting in there like it's it's sugar yeah like it's it's not some mystery chemicals that'll give you cancer yeah like it's not good for you but at least you know what it is yeah and you know it's not like a what do they call uh what is it the things that give you cancer uh Uh, carcinogens yes yeah at least you know it's not one of those. So, anyways, it just had to bring that up. Yeah, it's how thinking it's about done. tuning down the old diets. <laughs> yeah, uh, just water, coffee, pib still safe. Occasional pib. Pib is still safe. Yeah, our um, little safe haven. Yeah. So Dune Two, we should probably start talking about it. It's all right. <laughs> it's an all right movie. Yeah. I mean, I've seen better. So. We talked about this before before recording, but we were like, <laughs> you were like, we really need to get our thoughts together because anytime a movie that's like of this magnitude, we just talk about how good it is and we don't really go into detail. And we had an extra week to think about it because we were sick and I was like, dude, every time I think about an aspect of it, I just go, it's just so fucking good. Like I, words cannot even... I'll try to articulate, but it is the, it's everyone involved in a project firing at all cylinders. Mm -hmm. The top, top men doing top shit. Top men doing top men things. Yeah. If you look down the line of just everyone involved in Dune and Dune 2, it is some of the best in the industry. Hans Zimmer. One of the best composers. The best. Fucking the best for me. Yeah. But just an absolute fucking animal doing the score. And it's incredible. It's wild. I listen to it when I shouldn't. I'll put it on at work. Whatever. You know? <laughs> dude, I've been listening like crazy to the dude, too. I was pulling wire today and I had to pause ornithopter uh attack i think is the name of the track i had to pause that to get on the radio and be like hey fucking feed that shit and then i played it again and i'm yeah fucking pulled yeah. it through absolutely ridiculous score insane uh hans zimmer is 
He's a madman. He's the fucking man. Someone lock him up. No getting around it. He needs to stop walking around like he's just a normal guy. Yeah. <laughs> That's the end of that. Yeah. So, uh, where do you even fucking start with something like this? So, for me, this movie has great, uh, been getting great reception from the masses. Mm-hmm. Everyone loves it. Most people love it. Uh, it's getting great box office numbers right now. The opening weekend was basically the exact same as Oppenheimer's, which Oppenheimer made almost a billion dollars. So that's great, great news. If that, you know, if it's got the legs and it keeps keeps going. Um, but apparently, it already doubled Dune's uh, box uh, box office, like opening week box office. Jeez. Which I guess isn't that crazy because Dune had a same day HBO Max release um, but the word of mouth for this is crazy people that don't even like movies are going to see it because yeah. the, everyone's just heard about it so it's making a ton of money and uh, there are uh, there are some people in the film community that aren't like as crazy about it as others but for me it's a five star and I think it's one of the best sequels ever made it's one of the best science fiction movies ever made and it's becoming just like one of my favorite movies because which seems crazy but dune was already one of my favorite movies dune was my like my number five favorite movie ever and this is just as good if not better so do the math there it's not that crazy to to think that um to think that it's one of my favorite movies ever and while we're talking about that there's been a lot of discussion about like is Dune better than Star Wars? And is Paul a better character than Anakin Skywalker and all that shit? Uh, I mean, I know how I feel about it, but... No, the answer is yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is. But the point the point I'm trying to bring up is... I've heard a lot of people say, like, the recency bias is crazy for Dune. And I would argue that recency bias is uh like it goes both ways and you know some people recency bias can be a thing and it can be like there's something that's new and exciting and people are way more into it at the time than they will be in a year and they're hyping it up just because it's new and it's fresh um but it it can also be people think that older movies are like grandfathered in and that nothing can top them yeah and it's like it is possible for things to come out and be better than other great things yeah when uh lord of the rings came out that was new that was a new thing in 2001 when fellowship of the ring came out that was a new movie just like dune 2 is right now yeah and a lot of people consider that better than star wars i would i consider it a lot better so I've heard a lot of people ask me if I think it's better than Star Wars. I, I don't know why. And I'm going to let you guys know right now. I genuinely am always shocked at how big the Star Wars fan base is. It's one of the worst fan bases there is. At, when I, when you toxic. watch Star Wars, I would like watch through Star Wars. I would not expect as many people to be so attached to those movies. It's because a lot of kids grow up with them and they think that they're like untouchable. Like they're, yeah. you grow up, I'm sure maybe that would have happened to me too. If I grew up with them when I was eight watching Star Wars, sure, maybe I'd have a bunch of Star Wars shit in my room and think it's the best thing ever. But I, that didn't happen. I yeah. watched them as an adult and I think most of them aren't really that good. I don't I, really have a big love for Star yeah, Wars. I watched them when I was young enough to have that connection with them. I don't have a single Star Wars movie at a five star. I don't think there's a single perfect Star Wars movie. Yeah. And like the the prequels are to me they're pretty bad but let's say you like the prequels. The sequels I feel like are universally hated. Yeah. And all the recent Star Wars stuff that's still coming out is bad but th- somehow it, people still love Star Wars. People, it still puts asses in seats like I, I, the Star Wars, Star Wars to me is an enigma on why people love it so much. Like there's people like I would never expect this person to like Star Wars, 
its fan base is so massive for like what feels like no reason. It's insane. But yeah, Dune Dune One is better than anything that Star Wars could ever like come up with. I can tell I, you. That I mean, I would free. agree, but I just don't feel like I don't know. I don't really know if it's even worth like arguing about if Dune's better than Star Wars, if Dune's better than Lord of the Rings. Like it's all personal preference and it all has a lot to do with if you grew up with it, if you have an emotional connection to it, blah blah blah. I certainly Dune is my favorite like science fiction franchise. Yeah. And um you know, that's how I feel about it. I don't have a ton of love for Star Wars. I think Lord of the Rings is great and I do love those movies, but I prefer Dune. And um but my just my point of bringing it all up is that I think that uh, recency bias goes both ways and that a lot of people don't want to admit something's better just because it's new. And yeah. it's like, there's no way a new movie is better than something really old that's great. And it's like, yeah. at one point, those movies, those old movies were new movies. Yeah. Like, it is possible for things to come out and be better. So they're not grandfathered in. If you don't think it's better, that's fine. But, I mean, I just feel like people are so one-dimensional with recency bias and they always talk about it like people are acting like Dune 2 is better than it is. But it's like maybe it's just one of the best movies ever and, you know, people are recognizing it. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, regardless of where you stand on like, oh, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Dune, the big picture thing is that this is happening right now. Yeah. Dune is... Like, I haven't had something like this with the exception of, like, the Planet of the Apes movies, the, the new ones. But I still, like, I watched, I don't think I watched Rise in theaters. And I don't, th- I don't think I watched any of them in theaters. They kind of, like, slid under the radar because Planet of the Apes wasn't, like, a property that I really cared a ton about. But the movies are fantastic. So this is, like, the first big sci-fi just world dominating trilogy Mm -hmm. that I've gotten since like the Dark Knight Mm -hmm. yeah it's like every 20 years the world gets like a huge science fiction trilogy that dominates pop culture and in the 70s and 80s it was Star Wars and then in the early 2000s it was Lord of the Rings and now we're getting Dune and I mean, God forbid people get excited about it. And we have blockbusters with huge budgets and huge casts. And they're actually quality movies. And not just goop. Not just conveyor belt corporate goop. Yeah. They're movies with incredible artists behind them that spend a lot of time on the details and ironing things out. And... um having layered storytelling and foreshadowing and uh, just such a breath of fresh air in terms of blockbusters because we never really get stuff like this. Yeah. And I love hearing about... I love seeing that Oppenheimer blew out the box office. Dune 2's blown out the box office. Keep them coming. Mm -hmm. I would have never expected Oppenheimer, like a biopic to do as well as it did. Yeah. I know I find that very interesting, but to the masses, I didn't think... It's crazy how much it made. Yeah. That's, like, the average person I would not expect to want to go watch an Oppenheimer movie, but it blew up. Dune's blown up. Keep them fucking coming, dude. Yeah. And, um, as mad as I was at the time about the delay, I think it, it was for the best for them to delay it. For, obviously, the Oscar stuff, it'll probably help There'll probably be less competition this year in terms of Oscars, but just for the box office, it was supposed to come out, I think October 22nd or some something like October or November, and that would have been like a couple months after Barbenheimer, and a lot of normal people, not like us, probably only see like one or two movies a year, yeah. and they probably wouldn't have gone to see Dune 2 coming off of Barbenheimer. Like yeah. That was their, their movie moment of the year, and... uh them pushing Dune 2 back to be basically the first good movie of this year with no competition 
like really I think was a smart move and yeah, is really going to help the box office which inevitably will help Dune Messiah get made even though I don't think that that's like I was listening to an interview today and Denise said uh, Legendary and Warner Brothers basically told him like no matter how Dune 1 does at the box office like they he showed Dune 1 to the executives when it was done and they said no matter how good this does at the box office we're gonna like you can make part two because this is awesome yeah and we're gonna let you finish your vision so i don't know why that would that their uh attitude towards it him and dune would change now from going from one to two to two to messiah yeah you would think they'd have the same outlook because dune part two is at least up to par with the first one yeah so i think dune messiah is just getting made and the question is like is he gonna go right back into Dune and finish it now or is he gonna do a, another movie first and then go back to Dune Messiah yeah because he said the script's almost done so he could certainly you know just start working on it and pump it out but that's a different discussion um, yeah. I think Denis at a point where he can just walk into a place and be like hey I'm gonna make this and they'll be like yeah yeah yeah, yeah Denis yeah <laughs> sure yeah he is uh, he's the fucking man here's a blank check yeah you take your cute face and you make something. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I guess we can just start random random thoughts. I have a bunch of notes. I've been trying to... I don't want to take notes during a movie because that just feels rude to have yeah. my phone out during a movie. And I'm also, if I'm taking notes, I'm missing stuff. Yeah. So, I've tried to just like, anytime I think of something in my head, I write it down. Like, I want to bring that up. Um, but first things first... The opening scene is fucking awesome. Dude. One of my favorite opening scenes in recent memory. Yeah. That's that's something I was going to talk about is from start to finish, this, this movie, Dune 2, feels like there's... It feels so fast. Mm-hmm. Like there's so much going on. It It almost like drains you. Yeah. It's almost like holy fuck, dude. And Calm see, that's down. that's a, some people's problems. Like, uh, if people do have problems with Dune Two, most of it is like pacing and having too much going on too fast. So I, I like it. I like it. I like experiencing that. That's what the characters are feeling, and I'm feeling it. See, so that's kind of how I. I think I, I'm a big pacing person. I think pacing's really important, but. When you, I don't know, like, apparently some people had trouble getting emotionally invested in the story, and the payoff at the end doesn't really work for them because the f first three quarters of the movie felt too rushed for them, which just isn't the experience I have with it. Um, so for me, it's like, yeah, it's, it's a pretty crammed movie, and there's a lot of really dense material happening, but... Um, when you have it's almost like complaining that there's too much good stuff in a movie for me yeah like i'm not saying those people are wrong if that's your if that's like the way you experience the movie and you thought it was too rushed like that that's a valid you know criticism but i'm just saying for me it didn't it wasn't a negative impact for me it's yeah. like a holy shit this is awesome like it's so it's moving so fast and also i don't feel like the first act really moves that fast I think the first act's actually pretty slow which is maybe why some people feel like the second half is you know too fast is because maybe the pacing's uneven yeah and maybe. the first half you spend a lot of time like you get a lot of intimate uh, moments with Paul and the Fremen yeah. and him and Shani I, and yeah. then the second half's very like uh, Getty Prime and yeah. and you're, you're doing this and then you jump into Lady Fenring and you have all this shit going on, but for I me, it didn't that. bother me negatively. It's for me, it's just like every scene is awesome. Yeah. Is how kind of I feel about it. Yeah, I don't think for for me, it's not like the pacing. It's just the the stakes of everything is so like immense. Everything that goes on is so so huge. Because we got a whole first movie of setup. Yeah, and I love Dune, and I don't. I think it stands on its own very well, but it is setup. Like, it is, it's not a complete story. So, getting to Dune 2 and you don't have to really introduce characters 
really, like one or two characters you have to introduce and everything else is just being carried over from the first movie and you get to just go straight into storytelling. Yeah. And I think that that's fucking gnarly. And the opening scene is incredible. I love the orange, like, sunset look it has. Yeah. It, it had doesn't like, really I, look like that for the rest of the movie. Yeah, they had a double eclipse in the sky. Yeah. And you could see it looks like it pans up to the sun on Arrakis and there's, like, two planets that's, like, kind of halved the sun mm -hmm. in, like, this double crescent. Yeah. It looks incredible. It's kind of like a knife or yeah. something. Yeah. Um, it kind of looks like a, like a battering. <sighs> shouldn't have told me that i know um be looking for it yeah so yeah the opening scene is uh paul with the fremen in the desert this is right after part one like instantly after part one there's been no time passed and um and then the harkonnens are hunting down the rest of the fremen and uh absolutely ridiculous sound design the Harkonnens float down from their ship. That insane will never not be the coolest thing I've ever seen. I love how it's silent too. Yeah, like it's always they did it in the first movie. It's them hovering Dude, down, but it's silent. The and first it's so movie, fucking creepy. They drop down and he's got the fucking sword out beside him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> fucking disgusting, dude. <laughs> Don't fucking do that to me. Yeah, God so bless. the Harkonnens, they show up and um, you get this shot. They're, the Fremen are carrying uh, Jamis' body because it's right after part one and they, they need to yeah. take it back yeah. to Siege Tower. And um, so they're carrying his body and they have to leave it there to like run away because the Harkonnens show up. And then you get this shot of like Jamis' body at the bottom of the frame and then the, the Harkonnens like up at the top of the dune like yeah. walk slowly walking down and they got to look so fucking awesome the stark dude. like these black like yeah. huge suits on and then oh beautiful uh costumes yeah. and everything that they did and they have like little vents on the back of their like i, I, I don't even on their back like on the back of their suit yeah and it makes the coolest sound yeah just little things like that people forget that um like people have to design sounds it's called yeah. sound design people have to design sounds for movies and yeah. that didn't that sound didn't just happen on set yeah like it's probably silent that that thing probably doesn't make any noise on his back yeah some someone in a lab with all these instruments had to create a sound for that to happen yeah and that that applies to the whole movie the yeah. whole movie both dunes have ridiculous sound design and we talked about it in our Dune episode, just like the Baron's shit on his back that, that clicks. Yeah. Um, that's that's what I'm saying, dude. Everything, it's everyone Everything's involved elevated. is operating on the highest level possible. Yeah. Everything that they wear, everything that they have, the, the weapons, the costumes, the sets, it is all to the highest like prestige yeah. of execution. Yeah. So um basically uh the Fremen call a call sandworms to eat the Harkonnens. They hear it and then they they say um uh I can't remember what they say, but there's this big like rock formation. Yeah, he says climb. Yeah. They say climb now. And then they start running up this hill towards this uh this big rock thing to stand on. And then they fucking start floating up. Dude. They hit their side, and then they start floating up, and it is the coolest shit. That we're so, shot. I saw that, and I was like, we're so fucking back. Yeah. Like, that shot sent me back to, they, they, there's this big, huge, wide shot of, you see them floating up this, uh, like, mountain, this thing. Mm -hmm. It took me back to Inception with the hallway scene. Oh, yeah. 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 That's what I was like. I haven't seen anything like this since like that. Yeah. This is the most incredible thing that I've ever seen. Yeah. So they, they're like hand, they're like just using their hands to like smack themselves yeah. up. It looks so good. It's, it looks real. It looks like anti-gravity suits. Yeah. Like however they filmed it, it looks insane. And it is beautiful. Like, oh, they've got these guys on wires. 
And then right afterwards, they peak the mountain and they continue to float forward on their stomachs like seamlessly. Yeah. And they go like back pushing to off of the rock like they're like underwater and they're like using yes. the ocean floor to like yeah. push them along. And then they go back to standing and then they hit their side and they're back to standing. I was like, yeah. How do you? And also you... the sound when they hit their side, awesome. Yeah. Just cool little awesome dude noise. Yeah. When you hit their side. But I was like, Denis built anti gravity suits. Yeah. Denis built jetpacks for these guys. Have to, I have to remind myself that it's a movie when I watch it. Dude, <laughs> yeah. like, I'm like, oh, those aren't real Harkonnens, yeah. and that's not anti gravity. Like, this is this is fiction. Yeah. Dave Batista's in pale. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I love the opening scene, and then they get to the top of the rock formation, and then they all start getting sniped. They all start getting pieced. Yeah. Crazy. I love how it's silent too, and you hear you just hear like a. Yeah, and then you see a little hole in the guy's head, and he floats down, and and then Paul and Jessica are down on the ground, and then all the Harkonnen bodies start falling down, slamming against Dude. the ground. Chair in the theater, fucking shaking. Yeah, as each body just like from from like a hundred feet up. Yeah, s- splat down. Brutal, like brutal sound yeah. design, and I love like an accurate. Not that I watch like real body videos yeah. of bodies, you know falling off of buildings but that's how it looks dude take like, a, take a raw chicken breast in your hand and smack it down on like a, a wood floor as hard as you yeah. can that's what it sounded like yeah like i don't watch people die for a living <laughs> but i can tell you that's how it looks when someone falls off a yeah. off a cliff like yeah. that's how it looks um so and then you get this little paul 1v1 fight with this guy they race towards this knife and um paul pieces him yeah as you do and then pans up guy at the top of the hill is about to piece paul jessica says fuck you bashes his brains in <laughs> bashes his fucking brains out <laughs> with a rock i'm just gonna got. bash him right the fuck in yeah. and that's something else too just talking about that one-on-one fight the fight choreography in the movie is really good so fucking good so good there's it there's doesn't not- even need to be <laughs> it could be horrible. Insane. Like the movie's great without it, and they also just have great hand to hand combat. I was like, I I wonder with with all this. Uh, I don't know. It seemed like in Dune one there wasn't a ton of like one on one stuff except for towards the end when he fought uh, Jamis. Jamis, yeah. And then like, there's just there's not that many cuts, and he's just fucking and they're just, just slinging knives at each other. Yeah. And it looks like people actually trying to kill each other. Yeah. Not like fighting overhead and doing shit that doing weird sense. lightsaber moves yeah, that make no sense. It's two men trying to kill each other is yeah. what you're watching. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, dude. It's a lot of like parrying and blocking and like Yeah. It's it's awesome. So, um, so good. So then pretty sure after that they leave, they go say straight to I always read it as Siege Tabor, mm-hmm. but in the movie they're saying Tabra. Because it's spelled T A B R. Okay. I'm just gonna say Siege Tabor because that's how I always said it, and that's how the audiobook says it. And Tabra sounds weird. It sounds like something the Freeman would say, though. You can say it if you want. I feel like <laughs> I'm gonna mess it up if I keep saying it. Um, but anyways, they go to Siege Tabor, and um, all these people start freaking out. They're saying, "You killed Jamus," yeah. and. Uh, and then this this one guy's like, they don't know what they're talking about. Lisa Al Gaib. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, he's like, they don't know what they're saying. And he gets down and and starts like praying towards uh towards Paul. And then like you see the places like split in half between people that don't really believe in the prophecy and people that do believe in the prophecy. Mm-hmm. It's just oh also like the Denis made a lot of changes, and that's new like the fremen being split in half between believers and non-believers is new like in the book every pretty much every fremen believes in the prophecy oh shit and he's doing a lot of interesting stuff with with that and uh and like he did a lot with chani's character too um in the book she's kind of just like a love interest Mm -hmm. and that's kind of it but in this movie Denise kind of making her more of a strong character and she has like she's very grounded in her beliefs on you know not putting your faith into a, a savior and saving yourself yeah and she thinks that the Fremen should be freed by the Fremen and yeah. and what's interesting is like 
there's been a lot of discussions about Paul, and most people know Dune's a cautionary tale, and Paul goes down a dark path. Yeah. To what extent, a lot of people don't know, and that's fine, I'm not going to spoil anything, but um, I heard people saying, I forget where I heard it, it was some podcast or YouTube video or something, but people were saying, I think it was TikTok actually, which would make sense because it was fucking stupid, um, but someone was saying that Paul is evil and doesn't care about the Fremen or Chani and is using them to get revenge for his father. I do not agree at all with that sentiment. Yeah. I think that it's possible to want both. It's possible for Paul to care about the Fremen, care about Chani, and also want revenge for his father. I think both of those things are true. Yeah. And he does have a dark side, like you see when his mom said, your father didn't believe in revenge, and he's like, well, I do. Yeah. So he isn't his father, and he does have his darker tendencies, but... That doesn't mean he's using the Fremen. I firmly believe he did have good, uh, like in this movie, he has good intentions. Yeah. Like he wants to free the Fremen. And, you know. Paul doesn't want. And he doesn't want to lead. Yeah, he doesn't want the power that people are trying to give him. Yeah. That's At his every whole... step, he's trying to say, no, like, I'm not the guy. I just want to fight. I just want to stop the Harkonnen. That's all. Like, and in the first movie, yeah. like they believe what they've been told to believe. Like he's very firm on all that. He doesn't. He doesn't like any of that shit, and he doesn't want to lead. He just wants to join the Fremen and fight with them. And if the chance arises, avenge his father. Yeah. Whoop de do. You know, big deal. And there's so many. There's so much cool shit in this movie. Like. You said in Dune One, there's they believe what they've been told to believe, but there's a lot of uh, like religious aspects that Chani talks about. With like, uh, she was like, if you, um, what did she say? If you tell them if a Messiah is going to come like, to save them, they're just going to sit there and wait. Yeah, they'll just they'll wait. Yeah. And I was like, holy shit, dude! And she's, it's almost like religion's being used as a weapon against. Them. Yeah. Like they're they're sitting there waiting for this Messiah that might not come and she's like we can we can like we'll just fight yeah we should just go over there and attack we can handle this tactically right now ourselves instead of just waiting around like idiots waiting for a messiah to come yeah and that's what it's a good time to bring it up i guess now that we're talking about this because you were saying that they're using religion as a weapon which uh ties back to the scene with jessica and paul when they're about to ride south and they're like off by themselves. Um, people are getting ready, and Paul's like, "It's really sad, like what you've done to these people." Yeah. Because the Bene Gesserit created the prophecy, and they're the people tying the Fremen down by this belief that there's going to be yeah. some Messiah to come to save them. And she said, "We've given them hope." And then obviously, it's in the trailer. Everyone knows it. That's not hope. Oh my God. Awesome. Yeah. There. Awesome line, awesome line delivery. Paul's Timmy's the fucking man. Yeah. But also, someone on Twitter, it was kind of a joke, but someone on Twitter was like, he didn't have to shout that. Like, he, Dude, did, he, no. would, he didn't have to shout at his mom. He's and I was like, he's not shouting. Like, he, yes, he's upset about his mom, but he's mad about his role to play in this. He's mad that he's been put in this situation. And because he's been hearing this, he, he, was, he, he was hearing this in part one. Like, he's hearing you know all these people looking to him to be a savior and you know he doesn't want to be well it's everything now it's it's everything he's yeah he he's been affected he's supposed to be the savior he doesn't want to be but now he's spent time with the with the fremen he's growing attachments with them and he's seeing like they have been enslaved because of this prophecy that he knows was forged by uh, by the Bene Gesserit. By the Bene Gesserit. So he, like, they have been suffering all this time for something that he doesn't really even believe in and want to be a part of because of stuff that's been put in place. Yeah. And, and the Bene Gesserit serve themselves. Yeah. They, 
uh, Dr. Yui says it in part one. He whispers it to Paul, like, right before the Gam Jabar scene. And he's saying, like, uh, I don't remember the exact line, but he, he says the Bene Gesserit, you know. I think he says those exact words. He says they, they serve themselves. Yeah. They have their own plan, and they don't have the best interest of humanity in, in mind. They're witches. Yeah. Like, that's what they are. Like, they're, they're not good people. Yeah. And... Um, so it makes sense why they would create a prophecy like that. And, um, I kind of thought my prediction going into this, not knowing anything, I thought Paul was going to leverage his power to kill the, the witches, mm. but that's just, that's what I thought going into it. I've been pretty sick if he was like fucking die. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't, I mean. I can't say anything. I, I read the book, so yeah, I, know, I, know. I didn't have any just, theories like saying. that. But when I was reading the book, like, I, I guess I won't get into that. I don't want to. I don't know what people know for sure based on watching the movies. Okay. I don't want to, like, confirm anything. I don't know. Anyways. Um, but, yeah, the, the scale of what's been happening with this prophecy and how it's affecting the people is at full display Mm -hmm. you see the big divide in the fremen between i think she's the southerners like um they're big believers in the yeah the southerners believe a lot and the northern tribes don't really believe in the the prophecy and, and the savior and so paul's afraid to go south because he knows that the fundamentalists are there and he's gonna like He's basically gonna, you know, they're gonna latch on to him, and that, they're gonna. He's gonna be. He, he's gonna start to become what he doesn't want to. Yeah, that and he's getting these visions throughout uh, the movie of, you know, people A dying, war and people yeah, starving, people dying in his name and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And he he just he doesn't want he doesn't want that. No. That's, that's why the people saying that he's evil is kind of nuts because he spends most of the movie avoiding moving forward because he knows that if he does move forward and go south that there's no going back and that the war is going to happen. Yeah. So that's what's so cool about Dune and about Paul Atreides as a character because he's a really tragic character because you've seen him from when he was 15 when he was just a young lad and... You see that he's a good kid. Yeah. Like, he's a good kid with a good heart, that has good intentions, who is basically, once he has drink in the water of life, like, he can see the future, and he knows what he's supposed to become, and what he is going to become. Yeah. And um, he can't really, like, stop it. And yeah. a lot of the movie is him trying to, and trying to avoid it, and just join the Fremen, fight the war with them, and that's it. But once he drinks the water of life, he sees possible futures, and he's pretty much like Doctor Strange in Infinity War when he says, yeah. there's one one possible way we win this. And yeah. like he says, I see a narrow way through, which is a lot cooler Another way. Another fucking great line to delivery. Yeah. Of a lot cooler way of, of saying there's one possible way to win. Yeah. So basically he knows he doesn't want to do it, but he knows what he has to do to win this war, so he does it. Yeah. And it's, it's very Shakespearean everything that goes on with yeah. him. Yeah. It's a tragic character fighting his own destiny. Well typical like Hamlet, like his destiny is laid out before him. He tries to defy it, and it winds up putting him back where he where it was laid out. Mm-hmm. Um, but Paul is trying to like escape what his fate is pushing him towards. Yeah, and I think that adds more to the tragedy of what's going on. Like he doesn't he doesn't want to do this, but there like once he takes the water of life, there is no other option. Yeah, that they don't come out on top. Yeah. He has to accept his yeah. destiny. The like his his life is written in the stars of like what's gonna happen, mm-hmm. and that's fucking crazy. Yeah, that's insane. Frank Herbert describes it in the novel many times as his terrible purpose. 
yeah. which is just a great way to put it. Um, so it's going to be impossible to like go scene by scene through the movie uh, linearly because I'm going to forget stuff. We're going to miss stuff. Yeah. Um, but I took some notes and they're all out of order because I didn't take them during the movie. I took them just like whenever Taking I thought of them. Day. Yeah. So I have some just random thoughts that I want to give. Um, first one, I wish towards the end of the movie, uh, when Chani, when they were in the, not exactly sure where you call it, but the scene when Paul turns into a badass and starts calling people out. That's when he's in the South. They hold Yeah, they're in meeting. the South, but like, I forget what that place is called, but they're in the little Fremen place. Yeah. And Chani is like upset and she starts walking away, and then she starts uh, yelling and saying, this prophecy is how they enslave us. And then Gurney yanks her down. Yeah. And I wanted her to have more of a moment right there and give, a, like, have an opportunity to give a longer speech and really, like, let her heart out on how she feels about it and try to sway people in her direction. Yeah. And I don't like that the second she started, like, really speaking out... Even though she was doing it earlier with, like, the smaller group of Fremen. Yeah. Like, she was arguing with Stilgar and stuff, and she's been very firm on it, but, like, all the Fremen were there. And not all of them, but a lot more than normal. She's very outspoken. Yeah. A lot more than normal, and I would have wished she could have gotten, like, at least a minute or two of, like, her, you know, really, like, fighting against it and getting her, speaking her piece and trying to sway people in her direction but instead she instantly gets yanked down not a huge fan of that move yeah um but a big one for me uh i have i'm very mixed on austin butler in the movie i heard i have some stuff jotted down too i wanted to see if we came came up with the same stuff but i heard a guy say that he thought austin butler was easily one of the best performances of the movie I've heard a lot of people say that. Yeah. A lot of, Austin Butler is a lot of people's like favorite parts of the movie. For and, me, I mean, I thought it was I mean, it's easy to Timothy Chalamet. Yeah. I mean, the whole cast is great. Yeah. You know, I think Timmy's the best performance in the movie and second is probably Chani. Yeah. So uh, uh, that's I don't know. That's a different conversation, but everyone's pretty much unanimously in love with Austin Butler's performance. And something about it, to me, like, feels off. And I think his, I think some of it is his, um, his accent being inconsistent. And it sounds different a lot in different parts of the movie. Because there's scenes where he just sounds like the Baron. Yeah. And if, if it's an over-shoulder dialogue and you're not looking at the character, you can't really tell who's talking. Yeah. If it's the Baron or Fade Rautha. Um, but there's times like when he's on Arrakis and he's questioning the Fremen girl. She kills like nine of their men and then he's about to torture with a flamethrower. But he starts talking almost like Hispanic. Yeah. And he goes, we already know everything we need to know. Yeah. Like what? That's not how you were talking earlier. Yeah. So it, it really like takes me out. He also, there's... There's a line where he sounds like Pennywise. Yeah. And which so, one was that? Because I don't. I think it. Watch, I, I think remember. it was um, when him and the Baron were like kneeling down to the Emperor. Oh yeah. It was one of the. It was something he said in that scene um, when like they they smacked the Baron over the head for being yeah. silly. Um, but his 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 accent comes and goes, and it's very inconsistent to me, and it. I, I don't really want to blame Austin Butler. I think Austin Butler is great, and I like him as an actor a lot, and I like him as a person a lot. Um, so I'm not. I don't really want to blame him. I think he did his best, but I also think some of the writing I wasn't a fan of for Fade, because There's, I think I know what you're gonna say. I don't know if you do. I mean, maybe I don't know. There's but, one line that I really don't like. Um, what? It's when Timothy says. Timothy says, "May thy knife chip and shatter," and he, and Fade just repeats it. I was like, "You could have said something." That wasn't more. what I was talking about. 
But I, I mean, I thought he was going to say something cooler. I did too. I did too. I mean, it doesn't feel out of character to just mock him, but it's also like, I think the line that bothers me more is right before that when he's he says, uh, "Good to finally meet you, cousin," and then he says, "Cousin, is that right?" Well, you wouldn't be the first fam- rel- relative I killed. Uh, yeah. Uh, what? Also, why that you, feels very Marvel movie. Why do you believe to him too? I mean, Paul wouldn't lie. Fucking, he's never met the guy. He's a terrorist to to fade. He's yeah. a terrorist. I don't. I just don't. I don't mind. May that knife chip and shatter. Because I think it's kind of funny, and it it is in his character, I guess, to mock him. But like. You wouldn't be the first relative I killed. It's just a little much. Especially when they already said earlier in the movie that he killed his mom. Yeah. So you're just like doubling down on it. But um, so the writing for Fade Rautha, I really wanted him to be like a menace. Yeah. Like he should be someone who feeds off of... Uh, they, they mention how he feeds off of pain. And like yeah. he loves the rush of like feeling pain. And um, you see him fighting in the arena against people. Someone's got a knife an inch from his head, and he's laughing. Yeah. And, like, that's awesome. I love when he starts laughing when yeah. the guy's about to kill him. Um, but basically, when he fights these people in the arena, they're drugged. And one of them isn't drugged and puts up a fight against him. He ends up killing him. He goes to the Baron, and he goes, I ought to drown you in that tub. And... To me, he, that makes him look like a bitch. Yeah. That first of all, he's fighting drugged slaves, like, and then he's upset. He's that- upset that one of them wasn't drugged, and like this should be a guy who, like, his gift from the Baron for his birthday gift should be the Baron sending the best of the best at him to give yeah. him some competition and to really feed off that. Yeah, and not be a little pussy boy and need. Uh, drugged slaves, not even like fighters, just like slaves that they found, like Atreides slaves. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> well, I think they were like uh, soldiers. They were, yeah. I mean, they were soldiers, but like, and people like they talk about how House Atreides had some of the best like military yeah. fighters. Yeah, that's fair. Trained by Gr- Gurney and uh, Duncan. So, I I get the the threat that they imposed, but them being drugged takes me out of it. I do really like the, like him taking off his shield though. Yeah. That was badass. Yeah. That was cool. And I, I know that them being drugged is just supposed to enforce like how crooked and, you know, how crooked the Harkonnens are and all that. But like, to me, it was like, it just makes Fade Ralph not as cool of a character to me. He should have been an absolute menace who fears no one who feeds off of, uh, you know, pain who feeds off of attacking the best of the best, knowing that he's the best yeah. and wanting anyone to challenge him. Yeah. That's the character that it should have been, but instead he's fighting drugged slaves um, and then gets mad at the Baron. And f- in the book, Fade's very loyal to the Baron. And I guess you see that later in the movie when they kiss, but like. Fucking hell of a kiss, dude. Yeah. Um, I wish I was the Baron. Yeah, so I don't know. I just thought that Fade could have been a cooler character yeah. and been more menacing uh, at the end. Like, I'm not really afraid of him at the end of the movie. Even yeah. the first time I saw it, I'm like, what? I mean, like, yeah. what has I he really done to have, for me to be afraid? I wanted him to have, like, a Bane screen presence. Yeah. Of, like, once when you see Fade, you're like, holy fuck, he's going to do something. Yeah. But... He didn't really have that. And he doesn't have enough screen time either. He's a small character. Like, he's yeah. not the main villain of the book. Like, he's just some side villain, like, yeah. who's in, like, three chapters of the book. So, um, I, I don't really know. I, I think I have some problems with the writing. I think he could have been a lot better villain. He needed more screen time. But also, I feel like the performance is a little uh, inconsistent at times. Yeah. But I enjoy him. But I don't think he's, like one of the best parts of the movie for yeah. me. Not he's, even, he's really not good. Close. And I only picked up on his accent wavering like a handful of times. So it's not like every scene it's like something totally different. You know, it, for the most part, he just sounds like the Baron. 
with a couple scenes of him sound kind of Hispanic and a couple scenes of him sound like some weird guy. Um, overall, he still did a really good job. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that that was something. Once you told me about the Hispanic thing, I can never unhear it now. Yeah, I want you all to pay attention next time you watch it. <clears throat> the scene when he's on Arrakis and he's about to kill the the uh, Soul Fremen, like, just listen. He has a, a hinge of Hispanic in his accent, and which is okay if he does it the whole time, but he doesn't. He doesn't. I mean, he, he sounds different in almost every scene, so yeah. uh, that kind of bothers me. Kind of takes me out of it. It just feels like acting to me. It doesn't feel like a character. Like when you watch The Dark Knight. That doesn't look like acting. That doesn't look like Heath Ledger acting. It looks yeah. like a character. And for me, even people without makeup or anything, like, to me, Timmy in that movie is Paul Atreides. Yeah. And Zendaya is Chani, and they're giving great performances. But for me, Austin Butler, it just looks like Austin Butler in a bald cap acting. Yeah. It doesn't feel like a character. I wonder if they'd gotten, like, if they wanted him to sound like the Baron, like... Why don't you just get like Alexander to be Fade? Because he he sounds like Stellan. Well, Fade's Fade's supposed to be young. He's supposed to be, you know, eighteen. Oh, okay. But Austin Butler is like twenty eight. But I guess uh, who cares? I think Alexander's like pushing forty though. So I don't know if that would work. God, he's a hot forty. I can tell you. That. Yeah, I wish they could have found somewhere to put him in though, because he's pretty gnarly. Yeah. Um. So. Yeah, next note I have is fucking Stilgar. Stole the show. Dude. Stilgar is the fucking goat. Javier is incredible. Some of the most, some of the best, <clears throat> like, comedic timing. And he's such a, uh, I mean, he he's most of the comedy in the movie, is, yeah. is Stilgar. With his fascination with Paul being the Lisan Al-Gaib. Yeah. And... Dude, like, there's a scene when Paul is like, "You're right. I'm not. I'm not the Messiah. Like, I'm just here to help. I just want to join the war with you." And it cuts, and he's and still goes off by himself talking to his fremen homies. Yeah. And he's like, "The Mahdi is too humble to admit he is the Mahdi," which is exactly why he is the Mahdi. <laughs> yeah, and it is. <laughs> Paul says he's not the savior. It's the next scene of him having a little meeting with the boys. Yeah. Instantly like, cuts to that. He's too humble to admit it, further proving that he's him. And he does like the... <laughs> <laughs> Dude, he's every crazy. time something happens <clears throat> in the movie related to Paul, he goes, as written. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's the fucking man. He I love. fucking loves He loves him Paul, some Paul. Dude. Yeah. I tell you. Um, he is so good. That like late in the movie when the emperor is coming down and he goes right on time, just as you foresaw. Yeah, and he looks at Paul. Yeah, <laughs> just as you foresaw. Just Mwadib. as you foresaw, Mwadib. Um, yeah, Stilgar is so fucking funny. That little speech he gives him when he's about to go into the desert, and he's like, "Don't listen to the jinn. Uh, yeah, the ghost spirits say, you know, they, they just they they whisper to you." Uh, boo. Yeah. No, but seriously, don't listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are demons. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't listen to them. <laughs> um, Little centipedes. Yeah. <laughs> um, it is so funny, and it never feels marvelly. It never like sacrifices the movie. It's just perfectly timed. Yeah. Uh, fits his character, um, and. At the end of the movie, like we're jumping around, but once he, once he kills Fade Rautha, and he goes, "Lisa Al Gaib," <laughs> the second out of that nowhere Fade falls over, he goes, "Lisa Al Gaib," <laughs> <laughs> he's like, and then yeah. they're about to go to war, and they're all getting on ships, and he goes, "Everyone on, Lisa Al Gaib, Lisa Al Gaib," screaming at the top of his lungs. Stilgar is the fucking. <laughs> Man, he is the number one fucking hype man, dude. Yeah. I want him in all my parts. Everyone needs a Stilgar. Yeah. Um. <coughs> so yeah, Stilgar the goat. Harken and jetpacks go hard. We talked about it. Yep. I don't know if they're not really jetpacks. I didn't know what to, anti-gravity buttons. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, jetpacks. Because I thought they were just initial like fall arrests to like 
fall from a far distance. Mm-hmm. And that's the first time I've seen them used to go up. Yeah. Like, we've only seen them descend. They're basically just, like, anti-gravity. Yeah. Like, either way you need it, they're just anti-gravity. Yeah. Um, the, the first time I watched the movie, I didn't know what was going on. But the Fremen breathing tubes on their heads when they're hiding in the sand. Yeah. That is fucking gnarly. Not in the book. You know... that <laughs> Denis created that. That's awesome. But when I first saw that, I was like, this is sick. But I didn't... <laughs> it didn't register to me that when the mouse came near Paul's, he went, get out of here. Yeah. He's like, <laughs> go away. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't hear I, it the first time. Yeah. I heard someone say something, yeah. but I didn't know who said it and what they said. And then the second time I watched it, and it was Muad'Dib fucking fucking with his breathing tube. He was like, "Go away!" Yeah. And then later in the movie, they're like, uh, "Muad'Dib likes Paul scent or whatever." Yeah. And I was like, "What are they talking about?" Like, I didn't, the first time I was like, "What are they talking about?" I yeah. I don't know. It was him. He's laying yeah. down in the sand. Yeah. Um. So that's really funny. But those breathing tubes are. I don't remember them being the being in the book. And that also is great because you always see the Fremen like come out of the sand, yeah. which logically doesn't make any sense because how do they breathe? Yeah. So they cleared it up, like they explained yeah. that's how they and you do see sand them attacks with those things, but you never see like the stem sticking out of the sand when they pop yeah. up. Yeah. So it's it's just another cool level of like that's like everything they have on them, everything the Fremen carry around on them has a use. Yeah, is all shit that they use. It's yeah. all their stuff. Yeah. And so um, <clears throat> that attack, the the attack on the first attack on like the Harkonnen, you know, like spice harvester, does kind of come out of nowhere, in terms of the pacing. Like it, I understand if people have a problem with that, but um, it's fucking awesome. That attack is gnarly. It's basically like when it starts and the Fremen jump out of the sand. There's like a twenty second long take of like them running. And taking out the Harkonnens. Yeah. It's pretty fucking sick. Yeah. And I love that sequence. Yeah. And then you've got Chani with the uh, rocket launcher uh, trying to take down the helicopter. Paul goes and pieces up the guy. And then yeah. the other one starts running towards Chani. He yells her name. Fucking. Tubes him. <laughs> <laughs> she tubes him. Last. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> she beams him into the side of the fucking yeah. harvester, dude. Yeah. And then they reload... Paul has this little plan. He's going to distract the helicopter, and then she's going to shoot it. Uh, the ornithopter. Sorry. Yeah. What am I? <laughs> Duh. Duh. <laughs> um, I like that his plan didn't work out. Yeah. Too. He goes, ah, shit. <laughs> as he's running. He's like, I'm going to run to the other leg. And the other leg it. lifts up. as Midway through, he's running, it lifts up. And he's yeah. like, shit. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I love when Chani shoots down his their plane it goes silent and then you see her running uh, along the sand and she lets out this little giggle and it's really cute and it's really think, funny I don't think I ever yeah she that. shoots it down and she starts running and she goes <laughs> and then <laughs> and then the the helicopter cra- the ornithopter crashes down and explodes and then Hans Zimmer's score goes nuts the second it hits the ground boom dude just and right before that you hear Chani just a little giggle like as she's running away just so happy and i love it i love that little giggle that they left i love in. the reveal of uh the shot that she took because that you see through the ornithopter like gunner perspective you yeah see them, it like, pans back to her to paul and he hides under the leg and then it goes back to chani and then you see her and she like raises her head up from her rocket yeah like it's already done like she's already and shot it and then it pans over, over and you see it fucking sticking into the side of their yeah. shield and he's like fuck <laughs> yeah it's fucking awesome that whole harkonnen attack is gnarly yeah. and that score the ornithopter attack score absolutely what, ridiculous i don't know what you're doing it's it's insane like yeah. his his score is fucking insane um, if i made dune 2 and han zimmer was like check this out and he played that i'd fight him i'd be like what do you want me to do yeah you're insane um next note i have is just i love the shot when paul's about to ride the worm and he sets the thumper, he gets to the top of the dude, <clears throat> and then it's like a long take of him like slowly walking to the right, and you see like the worm sign in the back. Yeah. Of the bat and like the back of the image like coming towards him. I just think it's awesome. 
Yeah. I just, I don't know. I love when you can incorporate like something in the front of the frame, like a real shot in the front of the frame, and then something like some visual effects in the back of the frame that lines up perfectly and looks right. I don't know. I just, I love that shot. Um, Getty Pride, uh, Getty Prime, black and white. The Black Sun. Yeah. In the trailer, we just assumed, like, oh, there, for some reason, there's a section of the movie that's in black and white. Yeah. And we come to find out it's not in black and white. Technically, in the canon of the story, it's being shot in color. But yeah. their planet has a black sun that makes everything black and white. Yeah. Absolutely ridiculous idea. Yeah. Their but, fireworks are black ink blobs. Yeah. That just shoot at the sky. Holy shnikes, dude, dude. And the score, the Harkonnen score. Let me let me give you a little give taste of this. Give the people a taste. That's dude. Dude, yeah, Hans is on another fucking planet. Right <laughs> he needs to be stopped. Yeah. The whole uh Harkonnen arena thing with Fade Routha fighting the the two gentlemen, three gentlemen fucking awesome even though i don't like that they're drugged i've talked yeah. about that but it's still an awesome scene i love the way it looks they shot it with infrared cameras oh my god because it gives it's a very different look it doesn't look like normal black and white yeah it doesn't look like someone shot a movie in color and then just made it black and white later yeah. it has a very distinct look because they shot it in infrared cameras and it gives the skin like a very like denis describes it as translucent yeah which I don't know if I would call it translucent because then it, to me, that would mean you're seeing their veins and stuff, but it gives it a very weird, mo like alien looking yeah. texture. They look like the guys, uh, they look like the Prometheus guys. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. And, um, it looks so fucking cool and it was such a great creative <clears throat> choice. Yeah. So then once you see them indoors, like you see the cut, like you see yeah. their normal skin color. you see Fade he's waiting to like go out into the arena and he's in normal color grading mm -hmm. and then he steps out into the arena and he turns like full like pale black and white yeah and i was like oh yeah. my god um dude. one specific shot i put in my notes that i wanted to talk about was just at the end of that fight when he pieces up the three guys in the arena and he's walking out hans zimmer plays this score that is ungodly and it's a silhouette shot of Fade walking in, like walking back in from the arena. And it's silhouette. You can't, it's just like an outline of him. And it's slow motion, him walking back in with the Harkonnen Arena theme playing. Let me see if I can get it right. This. Dude. It's him walking back into that. Yeah. It gets me so fucking hard. It is so cool dude i would watch an entire movie on just yeah. getty prime it is dude. so fucking yeah. cool and something else it does with the infrared cameras like it gives everyone black teeth too well he just has black teeth i don't think he does because yeah. um that lady uh, i always forget her name what's that lady's name who uh the one on getty prime that meets uh with fate ralpha lady finring yeah, like her, the gaps in her teeth are like black. They're like enhanced. Uh, I'm going to look up Fade Routh versus Paul because I'm pretty sure he just has black teeth. It kind of looks like he's, uh, like he doesn't have teeth in this scene. I'd, I'd know for a fact whenever they're fighting in Getty Prime, he's got black teeth, but I don't think he normally does. He doesn't really show them in this scene. Yeah. But they're they're black. Are they? Yeah. Oh. I thought that was like an effect from the infrared cameras. Oh, yeah. No. He's just got black teeth. That's um, kind of crazy. Yeah, crazy character design. Um But yeah, Getty Prime is awesome. I love every scene on Getty Prime. Fucking Let me see. Let me see what more we got. Um Oh, jumping all over, but I love at the end when he <clears throat> p 
pieces up Fade Rautha, and then he walks back to the Emperor and holds out his finger for her, for the Emperor to kiss his ring. And Paul's sitting there, there's no score, and he's just breathing. Yeah. And it's a very small detail, but I love that shit. Yeah. He's sitting there holding out his ring. And they hold it for like 15 seconds. Yeah. And I think that shit is so gnarly. And he fucking stomps on the ground. Dude, yeah. Pissed off. Doesn't even like, say anything. Like, fucking do it. Yeah. And the emperor fucking old walking gets down on his knee and kisses the rams. Dude. I he bitched you. Love he bitched that you in shit, front of dude. everyone. Um, I guess we can, while we're here, we can talk about the finale. It's fucking awesome. Yeah. That's actually a note that I had was, um, like the death of uh, the Baron uh, being pretty quick. Like I knew the Baron wasn't going to be like some boss battle, right? He's a big fat guy that floats mm-hmm. around. But <laughs> but I wasn't expecting him to get hit on the back of the head by some other person. And then uh, Paul coming in just stabbing him. I don't I mind. I did love the line. Of him saying, you die like an animal? Yeah. You fucking filthy bastard. Yeah. Didn't he say that about his dad? About Leto? I don't remember. I think that's a callback to something. I remember somebody in Dune saying, you die like an animal. But I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if Paul's ever been face-to-face with the Baron before, though. I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember. I think it's a callback to something, though. But I don't mind the way the Baron died. I think it's actually pretty sick. I was really confused the first time I watched the movie why people, ju- all the Harkonnens and Sardaukar just let Paul walk in and kill the Baron and leave. I was like, what? This is who y'all have been looking for. Like, go kill him. What are y'all yeah. doing? He's just standing there. And then it took me a second watch to realize, like, oh, they're outnumbered. Yeah. Like the Fremen fucked up the worms and the Fremen fucked up their entire army yeah. and Paul has the numbers on them. Yeah. So Everything's been gobbled up. They may be able to kill Paul, but all of them are fucking dead if they kill Paul. Yeah. So, and that um, was kind of like their, the plan that they had hatched was after they spoke, um, they can't kill Paul because that would just, yeah, that would make him more powerful. Reading, killing a religious leader only makes it worse. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it it confused me first watch and then second watch. I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah. <laughs> I started thinking about what Gurney tells Paul at the end. <laughs> oh yeah, um, yeah. So at the end, um, I heard I heard this from another podcast. So I'm gonna shout them out. There are too many movies. They're my favorite movie podcast, so I'm not I'm not stealing their joke. It's from yeah. them, but they were talking about at the end when um, <laughs> Gurney asks uh, Paul like what to do, yeah. and he he says like let the great houses know I'm taking over as emperor basically. Yeah, and then um, and you know if they don't agree, there's gonna be a war, and Gurney <laughs> Gurney comes back and he's like, yeah, I told him uh, they said fuck you, Paul. <laughs> 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 I thought that joke was so funny. Um, but I don't mind the way the Baron died, but I do mind how Raban died. And I thought Raban that's, died way too quick. That's what... Oh, sorry. That's something else I had was... I feel like Raban died quick and the Baron died quick. And then we had a really solid sequence with Fade, which I expected. But... the No, no. More than solid with Fade. Yeah. That fight scene is fucking awesome. Oh yeah, dude. The combat in that scene, and I love, I love when climactic, like fights that have been built up to over a movie, cut the score. Oh yeah. Like the Dark Knight the Rises and the sewer. is turned up to eleven. Dude. It's so much better without a score. It doesn't mm-hmm. seem like it would be. It seems like how could putting a badass score in there not make it better, but it just does. Yeah. Just having intimate fight scenes with no score is so much more intense and uh it's fuck it. his fight with fade is awesome yeah and so yeah just had to say that but i understand why raban was killed so quick because it's gurney versus raban raban's a bitch he's a coward that's yeah. like 
you can't really tell as much in part one, but in part two, it's blatantly obvious he's a coward. Yeah. He runs away many times. And he, and Gurney's a dog. Yeah. So Gurney it makes complete sense. In the galaxy. Yeah. It makes complete sense why Gurney pieces him, pieces him instantly. I understand it. But it's also like, this is a movie, and I would appreciate a little more of like, a fight yeah then just like him instantly like also, he like, dodges one move also you see gurney halleck coming towards you to murder you and you're breaking out nunchucks that's had, your weapon of choice you had a whip to defend yourself it was a whip they were i mean they were like like not he was whipping him with it but they were like nunchucks like, was it they're like shaped like nunchucks they're dune versions of nunchucks oh, okay. but like like that's your best method of I don't know. of defending yourself. Either way, it's kind of weird because, like, throughout the movie, he's like a coward and running away, but then Gurney Halleck yells and starts walking towards you with a sword. Yeah, and you don't continue to run away. Yeah, I'd have been like, <laughs> I, I, I'm so, sorry, I'm a I'm a coward. <laughs> I would have been shiver fucking, me timbers. I would have been out of there. Yeah, yeah. That's that's another thing I didn't get was like. Why didn't he just run away? He's been running away the yeah. whole time. They like, also I've... put that in the trailer, which kind of sucked. It was like Gurney walking up the steps with the army and like uh, Robin and his guys. Like, like this is going to be the face off. Yeah. And then Gurney just fucking ate him for breakfast, yeah. dude. <laughs> also, one thing I did have been thinking about, which kind of disappoints me, that I haven't really heard anyone say. Almost every one of my favorite moments in the movie was in the trailer. Which is something that, like, kind of makes you feel like on first watch you're almost going through the motions, which kind of sucks. Um, I mean, think about every good thing in the movie, like every great thing that you think about when you think about Dune 2. No, I think you're about right. You're right. Paul walking out on the ledge in front of all the Fremen and saying, Long live the fighters, in the trailer. I think about him saying, I am Paul Muadi Betrades, Duke of Arrakis, in the trailer. Every may moment thy knife that, chip and shatter. May thy knife chip and shatter. Um Gurney and, and Raban about to fight. Like yeah. almost everything that really gets me going was in the trailer. And um that's and to their credit, they made one of the best trailers I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. So it worked. Yeah. They busted out the big guns. They put ass in worked seats. Because it's also making a ton of money. Maybe because of how good that trailer was. So yeah. I understand, but also like, damn, like there wasn't really the worm shot, the three worm shot Dude. from the war. It's like, yeah. there isn't much in the movie that surprised me because it was mostly in the trailer. Yeah. And we saw the worm, uh, him riding the worm in its totality because it was the sneak peek at the end of Dune 1 when we saw it in the re-release. So oh, kind of disappointing that like, I'd say... One of the main things that was, like, fresh to me, at least visually, that wasn't in the trailer was, like, the opening scene. Yeah. I don't think there was, like, anything from the opening scene in the trailer. Yeah. I, um, I think you're right. They did have almost all of my favorite shots if I go through the old spank bank in my head of Dune 2. The overhead shot of him walking walking through the Fremen. Dude, uh, that's what I was about to talk about. That's in the trailer. That whole sequence, him walking through the, the overhead shot of him walking through the Fremen... I'm coming. It, it reminds me of... before that, he's walking... They're looking at him walking up to that place in the south. He's got the fucking hood up. Mm -hmm. It's like kind of a blurry shot. And you see the worm fucking coming up and crashing behind them. One of my favorite shots in the movie. I... It means nothing. It doesn't do anything. But it's the most badass thing I have ever seen in my entire god yeah. dang life. One of my favorite shots in the movie. It's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. It's... Who the fuck are you? <laughs> what are you getting at? Yeah, I love that shit, dude. Yeah. Uh, the last... I mean, I love Dune, 2, Dune Part 2. I love the whole thing. I love every scene. But the last 45 minutes of Dune 2 is like... I'm non-stop coming. Yeah. I'm coming for 45 minutes straight. And... I fucking love everything. That Dude. happens in the second half of the movie. At the end of Dune 2, 
if if like I wanted to have sex, I'd be like, Couldn't. Oh, dude, I'm tired. I'm out. <laughs> I'm all out of juice, honey. I'm shooting Sorry, Bla- <laughs> I'm shooting Blake's, honey. It's, over, it's gone. <laughs> These puppies are flat. <laughs> I might as well be on Arrakis. Yeah, also. Fremen, uh, I'm preserving my yeah, body's water. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Uh, Fremen preserve their body's water. They don't cry or anything. So you're telling me Fremen can't whack off? Unless they recycle it. Unless they edge. Maybe. That's what they got to do. They do just enough, but then right before they're about to lose their body's water, reel it back in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> back in. What a bad time! If they can't, if they can't whack off, what's, what's oh, even the man, point? I'm real close, and that's just enough to keep me going. What, what do you even need the Muad'Dib for? You can't yeah. whack off. Your life's meaningless. Yeah. So fucking kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> oh, also, I gotta talk about it, dude. Uh, there's a scene throughout the growing love interest between Chani and Paul, mm-hmm. and. <laughs> Chani's trying to show Paul how to work this uh, wind harvester. And he's like grinning like an idiot. I was like, yeah. dude, are you you trying to kiss me right now? <laughs> dude, I love it. You trying that. to get my pants? He was he was giving her the fuck me eyes. Timothy Chalamet, if, if he looked at me like that, if I like saw him in like wherever he was at, if I saw him at a bar and he looked at me, I'd be like, dude. I mean, normally I'm not I'm not I don't do this kind of stuff, but I think what I am is I'm a proximity gay. (laughs) I think on a regular day, I would consider myself heterosexual. But if I got within 15 yards of Timothy Chalamet or Ryan Gosling, my gay switch turns on. Yeah. And I'm now gay. Yeah. I think that's how I'm going to identify from now on. There's certain people that inside that proximity will activate the switch. Yeah. Timmy's one of them. Instantly turned. I'd be like, I don't yeah. know. What are you doing? <laughs> You're going to get us in trouble. <laughs> stop. Tim. <laughs> stop that. Auga. Fucking Timothy Chalamet's handsome ass. <laughs> um, okay, what else do I got on here? Fucking. Oh, yeah. I just. I put in here, does Paul care about the Fremen and Chani? Like, to bring up that whole thing I brought up earlier about, oh, like, yeah. Paul's evil and oh, 100% all that noise. Does. Paul's a very complex character, but he's not evil. Yeah, no. At least, at least not in these movies that we're watching, he's not. Yeah. That's, all, that's what we can say for sure. Like, he's an anti-hero, and he, but he does have morals, and he does have... A good side and it's not just all some part yeah. of some evil plan the dude's the dude's like on his knees crying about what he knows is going to happen and Chani's like you know I'll always love you and he's like then I will go and I'll do what I know needs to be done mm-hmm. and he goes and fucking dies <laughs> goes drinks the water of life dies fulfills the prophecy also She'll continue dude when he drinks the water of life and Chani brings him back to life. She gets mad. She slaps him. She leaves. But we get a sick ass shot oh, to dude, don't, Hans Zimmer's don't score. Even talk to me about it. Hans Zimmer's score called Resurrection, and it's Paul standing up after being resurrected and looking and like looking over his shoulder to this. Dude. Came in my pants, and it's <laughs> of course it's Stilgar stared at him with his mouth, his like, yeah. mouth gaping, <laughs> and he's like, "Holy fuck, dude, this <laughs> is our guy, Lisa <laughs> Nagaib." Yeah, that shit's fucking gnarly. I guess I want to talk about some of my favorite moments in the score. Um, Warm Army is absolutely ridiculous, and the second half of Warm Army has a moment that gets my dick even harder than normal. Let me. This is normal war money right here. Absolutely come in my pants. Yeah. But there's a part where he, the drums kick in, and it reminds me of the Dark Knight Rises. Oh. And it, the fuck. shot in the movie is him walking. It's out of focus, so you can only see like 
vague shapes yeah. but it's paul walking and then the fremen like running behind him yeah and the drums kick in oh my god yeah Dude. It, it is like that it's so fucking awesome, dude. Yeah. I love that shit. <laughs> Are you kidding me, Hans? Oh, dude. Are you fucking kidding me? I forgot me? about whenever uh, Raban first attacks, like tries to attack the Fremen mm-hmm. after their harvest. And he's attacks. asking from Wadib. Yeah, he's like, show yourself. Fucking, they start ghosting these guys. Dude. Yeah. His men, Raban's men. Are dropping left and right. You just hear, and the Fremen are so quiet. You hear a little, yeah. And, and then there's they're dust dropped. everywhere from these missiles that got dropped. Everything's blurry and dust. And then all of a sudden, just straight up, like Paul's walking towards him out of the mist. Just you and just see a, a little silhouette. It's it's like yeah. dark. You can't really see who it is. You just see like a cloak. Yeah. And then Raban starts running away. And then you get this fucking shot of a bomb that goes off and lights up his face and it, it illuminates his face. Fucking just God bless dude. Dude, it, this movie's made for me, dude. I want to just grab somebody and shake them. I just want to give them. somebody a stern talking to. Yeah, dude. Just fucking open someone's mail. Yeah. I want to fucking high five. Someone, <laughs> I just want to high five. Didn't be like, you see that fucking shit? Dude? <laughs> you fucking see that shit? Dude. dude. Yeah. So I've been, I was listening to a podcast recently about uh, Dune 2 from people who uh, are known for not really liking popular new movies. They're mm-hmm. like, you would, I'm not going to name names, but you would call them like artsy people. And like, if it's new and popular and everyone loves it, they're going to act like they don't like it. Yeah. And they're going to like weird stuff. And uh, I just, everyone has different tastes. Everyone has different things that they get excited about for movies. And... My thing with movies, I love all kinds of movies. I love foreign movies, black and white, doesn't matter. Drama, comedy, sci-fi. All shapes and sizes. Any good movie, I'm open to it. If you say it's good, I'm open to it. I'm not closed-minded to anything. Yeah. But my favorite types of movies are spectacle movies. Yeah. Things that take me to another place and get my blood pumping and have big, big high-stake things going on. Yeah. And for some people... That dude, that does nothing for them. And I was listening to this guy um, talk about Dune 2, and he said, like, stuff like that really doesn't do much for him. And he he cares more about, like, um, the technical aspects of filmmaking, like camera moves and how do you edit a scene and blah, 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 and how do you block a scene. And, like, uh, it just really clicked with me. Like, everyone goes to movies for different things. Yeah. And... The <clears throat> last thing I'm thinking about when I'm watching a movie is, like, how it's edited. Yeah. And, uh, you know, unless something's really bad and I notice it because it's really bad. And I'm like, yeah. ooh, why'd they do that? It's like taking but, three and there's yeah. 19 cuts. Yeah. Um, and I'm picking up an apple juice. Yeah. But this guy was talking about, like, oh, D- Denise movies are so, like, his dialogue scenes are so boring because it's just close up of... of person A and then a close up of person B and then you just cut back and forth and I was like okay I mean I, I'm listening to the dialogue so I don't really yeah. I was gonna care say about the dialogue is cool enough that like the dialogue connects with me more than the editing does yeah yeah so I'm just not even really thinking about that stuff and I can appreciate great camera moves when they happen and stuff and uh, one takes and when you watch stuff like Sam Raimi or um, like um, Brian De Palma, like you'll notice certain things that are great about filmmaking, but it's like, I don't, when I'm watching a movie like this, I don't care about any of that. Yeah. I'm, I'm invested in the story and in the spectacle. And I love, that's why I love Christopher Nolan and Denis Villeneuve because they make sci-fi movies, but they make movies with huge scale that yeah. transport me to another place. Yeah. And that's just, you know, what I like. Yeah, personally. No, I'm I'm right there with you, dude. It's it's all it's so good. And like I said, this is just the A team of like a group of people doing everything perfectly. Yeah. And I think that I I really don't have any flaws with Dune and Dune 2. 
No, they're I don't either. looking perfect. Timothy Chalamet is perfect as Paul Atreides. Even he's like, going to go down as one of the best castings mm, of all time. Yeah, I think he's he's such a tremendous actor, dude. And honestly, everything he does, the amount of like emotion that he's able to give off, like just the very end of him looking at Chani and he's like, "I will love you as long as I breathe." And like walks away. Yeah. I was like, dude, love me. Dude. Yeah. What are you doing? Timmy is such a talented actor. He's becoming just one of my favorite actors. The amount of work he has under his belt at just the age of 27. And I mean, the he's showing so much range with all of his roles. And I mean, just within a span of a couple months, he's been Willy Wonka and Paul Atreides. Yeah. Like, that tells you all you need to know. You see... Dude, the scene in the Fremen Temple at the end when I was talking about, you know, when, when Chani starts to give her speech and gets dragged down, when he walks the fuck in there, and first of all, he just looks like a badass walking in there. Yeah. He's just got that look on his face. Like, he's he knows what he's about to do. And he goes in there and starts speaking Fremen. He starts speaking Chakopsa. And I don't know the words, obviously, because he's speaking Chakopsa, but... He basically goes in there like, ah, cookie, nakatoka. Yeah, dude. And he, dude, he fucking sells it. That's what like, I was like. He's so say. menacing, and he's so, he has such a screen presence. About I would him. have never believed, like, watching, someone with his frame watching Wonka. Yeah. Like, call me by your name. Yeah, he weighs like, 110 be, pounds, yeah, soaking he's wet, well thin. He's got gorgeous hair. <laughs> yeah. And he is so intimidating, dude. Yes, dude. He go whatever he he says the words in like whatever language, but what he's saying is there is no one here in this can, room who can ta- who can challenge me. Yeah, and I was like, I would have stayed, sat the fuck down, dude. dude. And I all the I also yeah, <laughs> I love his his performance in the movie and in that scene, the screen <clears throat> presence he has and the command that he has in that scene is ridiculous. Yeah. And I love that entire scene. I love how he singles out that one guy and says something he could not know yeah. unless he was Muad'Dib. And he convinces everyone. And then he gives his speech. I'm Paul Muad'Dib Atreides, yeah. Duke of Arrakis. Oh, That's my man. fucking shit. He right says there, your dude. your parents told you to fear to fear my coming or something yeah. like that. I was like, oh yeah. Dude. That's some Old Testament shit, yeah. dude. Get that me scene that. Is fucking gnarly, yeah, dude. That's probably his speech at the temple is my favorite sequence in like the entire movie. Yeah, it's probably mine. When too. you have an entire war that goes on, and a speech is the part that yeah. I'm like latched onto, you've got something incredible, dude. Yeah, something incredible. That scene is fucking. Yeah crazy i love it i'm crossing my legs in public if that scene's playing that's all i'm saying dude. i lead the way oh, are you fucking God, joking dude. me and then still grows yeah do you really think <laughs> i would deprive myself of one of our best yeah do you smash a knife before battle god, god that's fucking what a fucking <sighs> idiot dude <laughs> <laughs> that guy's a more fucking call him names yeah. <laughs> If I was at that meeting and he said that to him, I'd be like, yeah, fucking sit down, dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to the Wadib here. <laughs> um, also, consider what you are about to do, Paul Atreides. Silence! Oh, my God. Abomination. Dude, and the little look Fade Routh gives him, like, oh, fuck. <laughs> oh, shit. This guy means business. When you make a literal psychopath like yeah. impressed kind of tangled his nuts a little yeah. bit whenever he, he hit her with the voice yeah that's also <clears throat> I, I thought it was obvious but that's a callback to the first dude uh, yeah. we saw it with my buddy who's like not really into movies and uh, and I had to explain to him that that was like a callback to the Gamja bar scene when he yeah. was like he was speaking out like he was making noise when he had his hand in he was like <clears throat> Yeah. And she went silence. You know, yeah. so that was a fucking you, awesome. He goes, You dare use the voice on me. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I could that's what I was saying. Like I was writing this stuff down and I was like, dude, I could rant for hours talking about each scene from this movie. 
how incredible it is, the way it made me feel. Like it's it's. I honestly am still in disbelief that I've seen what I've seen. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, and, and it's there's crazy too much. There's too out. much to praise that it's like we're gonna miss something. Yeah, and um, and I don't mean to. I I, I typically don't like to and uh you know partake in over hyping stuff and having recency bias, but it just happens to be that this is right up my alley. Yeah. Like this is the shit that I like. This isn't some phase. <clears throat> Four years from now, Dune part two is going to be one of my favorite movies. I can tell you that. Yeah. Like this is the shit that I like. No, I think like the, the trilogy is going to be something that people talk about for a long, like I think the Dune trilogy is going to be like, People are going to talk about that the way they talk about Lord of the Rings now. Yeah, and in, in Star Wars, yeah. even though it's better than both. Um, that's just how I feel about it. It's my preference. But Lord of the Rings is a real fucking masterpiece of a trilogy. And yeah. I understand why people love it, and I do love it. But Dune is more for me. Yeah. It's more my thing. No, I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, if, someone, if someone wanted to say that Lord of the Rings was better, I would be like, you know what? That's your opinion, man. But the Star Wars shenanigans, cut the fucking cut, the, cut the crap. Okay, <laughs> we're done. <laughs> with a load this, of crap. <laughs> we're done with this fucking game that you're playing. Yeah, I had it up to here with these guys. Yeah, and it's over. I just I, saw a sequence from the Mandalorian, their beloved Star Wars franchise, where Lizzo and fucking Jack Black were like throwing food at. Uh, I don't even remember the fucking thing's name. Baby Yoda. Grogu. Grogu at a uh, dinner table. Well, yeah, that's what you want in Star Wars. This is this is your fucking hero? This is your champion? Is this your king? Yeah, dude. Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah, that's not... Not for me. Yeah. Um, not happening, pal. Star Wars is definitely the most overrated franchise of all time. Yeah. There's like 11 movies. Like two of them are good. <laughs> yeah, that's solid what I'm saying. Two. Like solid, maybe three. I think the MCU has more good movies than they do, and people like a lot of people hate the MCU right now. Well, the MCU also has a lot more movies. Uh, yeah, so I'd hope I'd hope they have more good movies, but um, but I think the first the percentage... nine movies in the MCU versus the first nine movies of Star Wars is I think you get more hits from the MCU. Probably, yeah. Probably. Um, I don't know. I need to check out Star Trek. I've been wanting to check out Star Trek. But to what to what extent? Like the originals and the new trilogy. The original movies. Yeah. Yeah, I want to see those too. Yeah, I feel like that'd be fun. I I definitely want to watch the the new ones because you got the old Chris Pine itch, dude. Mm-hmm. We watched Horrible Bosses too. Uh, the other oh, he's day. in that, and he is in it, and he is hilarious in it. He's awesome. He's great. I wanted to watch them uh, right after I finished Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, God, he's, he's just so good. good. Yeah, I saw the whole new Star Trek trilogy on 4K at uh, McKay's for like thirteen ninety five, and I thought about buying it because it's on all on 4K for you know all three movies fourteen bucks. Didn't buy it. Yeah. I've been seeing a lot of crazy stuff recently. Today, I saw uh, uh, The Amazing Spider Man, like two pack. Yeah. 4K. It's like the Digibook kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, On eBay, they're like 50 bucks. And it was 13. Dude, I'm overdue for a good McKay run. And I didn't buy it. You want to go tomorrow? I just don't. I don't need The Amazing Spider Man on 4K. I have it on Blu ray. That's good enough. I don't really need it ever. Yeah. <laughs> I like, <laughs> I like having uh, comic book movies for some reason, even when they're not good. I'm kind of a like completionist when it comes to comic book movies, except for like the MCU. I'm just not collecting every MCU movie. That's just I'm keeping the good stuff, and that's yeah. about it. You got your copy of Blank Man in here? Or not Blank Man. I was about to say, uh, is it? What is that? Uh, our Dark Man. I I used to have Dark Man. I think I returned it once we watched it. Hell yeah, you did. Hell yeah, you did. Yeah. I mean, Darkman's fun, but 
I just don't need to own every movie, you know? I'm a completionist about, like, weird, weird things. Like, I want to have every X-Men movie, and I do have most of them. But not every Marvel movie. And I have, like, the bad uh, DC movies. Well, not bad. Like, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, you know, DCU stuff. Don't really need them. But you got them. Just in case. Yeah, you never know when you'll need some shit. Um, yeah. But I guess overall thoughts, Dune 2. It's hard to even put into words, but I just think it's something that we're probably never going to get again. Like, this is just the stars aligning on a different level. Yeah. It's a studio giving someone a huge budget. I mean, just the cast alone, like... The fact that we have a, a cast where Javier Bardem and Josh Brolin are, like, side characters. Yeah. Stellan Skarsgård, Austin Butler, F- Florence Pugh, like, they're side characters. Oh, Anya Taylor-Joy. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Which was a secret. Which, it was weird. It was like, they, no one, they weren't revealing she was in the movie, but then they had her show up to the world premieres. The heck? So Pete, that was like when people found out she was in the movie yeah. was when she was showed up to like the Mexico City premiere. It was like, so wh- why didn't you just put her in the trailer? If you, I don't know. Denise said like, we just wanted to have like a surprise for the fans like that wasn't in the trailer. And I was like, okay, so don't have her go to the premiere and yeah. then they'll see it in the movie. Yeah. But I knew, uh, I knew it ahead of time, like before I saw the movie that she was in it, but. I figured it'd be a small role since she's not in the trailer. Yeah. Um, and we could talk about, like, what Denis changed from the book to the movie, but that's sort of spoilers for the book, I guess. Yeah, Some I kind of want to read, read the book. I'm going gonna, gonna to finish Dracula, hit Hail Mary, and then I'm going to read Dune. Yeah, Dune is a tough read, but it's a lot easier once you've seen the movies. Yeah. I'll, oh, Without a doubt. Because I can, like... I'll just picture everyone is who they are in the movies. Yeah. It helps a lot. I read Dune after seeing the first movie. Like, instantly after. Like, I saw yeah. Dune and I was like, holy fuck. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna go read that. That's yeah. really cool. And I wanted to know what happened. Yeah. Um. So I had, like... When I when it says the Baron, I'm like, ah. My Rockus. Like, I, I don't you know read him. it as Stellan's voice. Yeah. And that's what's... That's what I kind of don't like about audiobooks is because when you're re- when you're just reading it, you can read it in that character's voice. Yeah. And it says Paul says blank, you're picturing Timothy Chalamet. But when you have the audiobook, it's like some idiot. You yeah. hear some idiot reading it. It's like, ah. Like, yeah, that, I wish this wasn't happening. That does kind of stink. But like, I read I read Norm Macdonald's book on the cruise and I read it all in his voice. Yeah. And As you would. And it made it more funny. If you were reading it without his voice, it probably wouldn't have been as funny. Yeah. <clears throat> um, apparently, the audiobook to Project Hail Mary is, like, amazing. Really? I didn't I didn't use it. I just read the book. But uh, there's... I can't get into details about, like, why people like the audiobook so much. Good but voice apparently, acting? it's... Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Um, is there, like... With an audiobook, is there, like, a little production that they do? Some of them, yeah. Um, Like the Dune audiobook, it's weird um, because it's inconsistent. It's like some chapters have it and some don't. But it seems like during the big, the important chapters of Dune, they have like an audio cast. Like they have a kid playing Paul and a kid playing Stilgar and a woman playing Jessica. And they read their lines. And sometimes you even get like some ambient score in the background. Oh my God. And like... It can be really cool, uh, but it's like a 22-hour audiobook, and they don't do it the whole time. So some chapters yeah. is just the guy reading, no yeah. music, and sometimes it's the cast. So some audiobooks like go a lot harder than others, because mm-hmm. um, if you have like an actual cast, like that's very immersive when you're listening to an audiobook. And I wish more like movies that did book to screen adaptations, like had the actors go and record an audiobook in yeah. their as their characters. I just feel like that would be so cool. That would be sick. To have like the Dune cast go record 
their their sections of the audiobooks because yeah. it wouldn't be that much because most of it is narration like ninety yeah. percent of a book is like not dialogue it's yeah. it's you know it's description just have some random setup, guy read it yeah. you just have to have them come in and read lines of dialogue which probably take a couple hours and they'd yeah. be done and I just feel like that'd be really cool like a you just have like you know film version you have yeah. audiobook film version and yeah. I feel like that'd be cool. I don't know. That would be really good. There's probably a market for that. Yeah. I feel like little, people would read and just do, do a markup. Like their sales would more. go a lot, you know, a lot better, I feel like, if, if it was the cast of the movie. Yeah, if you did, like, the film version and then you did, like, an extra couple bucks for the film version. Yeah, or do Lord of the Rings and, like, get bring back the, a Lord of the Rings cast to do an audiobook. Yeah. And, like, read their lines and their voices. That'd be so cool. Yeah, that'd I'd be awesome. I'd buy that instantly. Yeah. Hey, I'm just giving out free ideas. Yeah. Fucking offering they, free money here. Yeah. They need to come and pick it up. Yeah. Um Yeah, I just think it's something where we don't get very often. Um it's the stars aligning a, a masterful director <clears throat> directing a movie about a book he loves deeply that he's loved his whole life. And it absolutely insane cast. The probably the best working cinematographer, the best Greg working composer. Freezer. All the stars aligning perfectly. You have emotion, you have romance, you have comedy, you have spectacle. I mean, I don't know. Dude, when I saw in theaters, when I saw him walking up to the meeting in the south, and the worms jumping behind him, my eyes started like gloss a little bit. Oh yeah. I was like, I was sitting there and they started to well up and I was like, this is so fucking good, dude. This is so incredible. And I was like, I got to push it back. My eyes welled up a couple times. I can't remember when though. Yeah. Um, it's normally during big shit like that. Like long live the fighters and fucking the scene we were just talking about. Yeah. Paul Moody betrayed us. God. Fucking crazy, dude. Yeah. Absolutely nuts. Um, <coughs> so, you like this more than the first one? They are... I think they're perfectly equal to me. Oh, that's cool. I I mean, I'd be fine saying I like the first one more. I'd be fine saying I like the second one more. To me, it doesn't really matter. I think that Denis Villeneuve is going to deliver three perfectly executed movies do you think if you do read dune do you think you're gonna read dune messiah before the movie i don't know i don't know if i because i've i'm a believer in um i always used to i debated reading dune very hard because i didn't want to ruin the movies for me yeah and i'm like how, how am i going to be excited if i know what happens my experience is it doesn't change anything. <laughs> it, it doesn't change your excitement at all. And someone actually asked me about that in like a group chat recently. But first of all, movies change a lot. So even if it happened in the book, it's not. It doesn't always happen in the movie. Um, but I'm not even thinking about stuff like that. Like, um, first of all, when you read a book one time. You don't remember everything. Like, you remember vague points. Yeah. Like, you remember the overall idea, but you don't remember, you know, specific things. And when I'm watching Dune Part 2, like, I was never once thinking about, oh, yeah, that, like, uh, this scene should be coming up. Like, when this happened in the book, that should be coming up. Like, I'm just watching the movie like anyone else. Like, yeah. It, it doesn't affect me at all, and it didn't affect my excitement at all, yeah. No, having read the book. So, I don't think you have any danger of, like... And I've read Dune Messiah, and I'm, it doesn't change my excitement to see Dune Messiah yeah. at all. So. I'll probably, if Dune is as good as you say it is, the book, then I'll probably be too excited to not not read Dune Messiah. And I think he's going to, I think Denis is going to improve upon Dune Messiah. There's a big problem I have with Dune Messiah that yeah. I think I'm hoping Denis fixes. I want to read God Emperor because that's got that's the coolest fucking title Dude, I've ever I heard. I found in my out life. people have been talking about Dune so much that I've 
I've started to get spoiled on like future books on like TikTok. Not spoiled. Is God just, Emperor not the last Dune book? No, there's six. Oh. God Emperor's four. But no one really talks about the last two, but I still may read them. Mm-hmm. Just so I can say I've read all the Frank Herbert Dune books. But I know like what the God Emperor is now, which kind of sucks. Is it a cool thing? Um, I, I kind of want to say it because I don't know who it is, but I know like what it is. You can tell me. And it's really interesting. It's really fucking weird. You can tell me. Apparently, okay, spoilers, I guess, vague spoilers for God Emperor of Dune, if that interests you. Apparently, the God Emperor of Dune is a human-worm hybrid. Someone turns himself into a worm. Dude. They turn themselves into a worm, <laughs> a pa- or do a- they make a human worm? I think baby? they make themselves a worm. That's pretty fucking insane. Yeah. So That's crazy. I don't know who it is. <sighs> But I gotta read that. I mean, that's <laughs> fucking crazy. The that's big, crazy. The big hurdle being Children of Dune. Yeah, that's the reason why I didn't care if you told me about God Emperor. Like, because you don't sounds, think you're ever gonna get to it. <laughs> if it's if you can't get through it, I'll probably would never touch Children of Dune, dude. Yeah, if I were you, I'd probably just stop it at, at Messiah. That's that's where Denise stopping, and that's probably where I'd stop. Yeah, um, God Emperor just sounds cool. People say it's really good. People say it's good. It's some people's favorite Dune book. I gotta, I gotta read it. There's no way I can't read it if that's their favorite Dune book. Yeah, with a I don't human know. worm hybrid, dude. That's crazy. That's nuts. Like, you, imagine the shenanigans you can get up to yeah. if you're a worm. If you're a then big sand like, worm, what are you doing to turn yourself into a worm? You doing the fly? Are they doing the fly? But the worm? Maybe. Maybe they're teleporting. Yeah. So I, it made me want to read it more. Like, I was kind of upset that I was like, ah. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll read Dune. Spark notes, children. Just get the bullet points. Then hit up human worm hybrid. You skipped Messiah, but yeah. That, you know. Hit yeah. Dune, hit Messiah. Spark notes, children. Maybe, I don't know, maybe the second half of children is great. I don't know. I'm, I'd say I'm about halfway through, but. I'm waiting anxiously for your answer, because if it's not. I'm going to just skim it. <laughs> it's just so dragged out, I think, is my problem with with it. It's so, like... What are the last two called? So it's Dune, Dune Messiah, Children of Dune, God Emperor of Dune, Heretics of Dune, and Dune Chapter House. Heretics. No cool. idea what Heretics or Chapter House is about, but they have pretty, like, generic names. Chapter House isn't a very good name. No. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, people stand by the Dune sequels, so I don't know. I may have to give them the old read, or maybe once I finish God Emperor, I'll just read the synopsis and see if they sound interesting. Yeah. I don't know. But it would be pretty cool to say I've read all, all six Dune books. Yeah. That'd be the biggest... I've never read like a series of books like that. And they're pretty long. Yeah, that's that's a that's a big boy group of books. But it's it's crazy because like, look at Project Hail Mary next to God Emperor of Doom. Yeah, right. Same size, same yeah. size book. I read Project Hail Mary in three days. That's that's but these crazy. Dune books. The Children of Dune is taking forever. Yeah, absolutely forever. This, um, this is your uh, second time trying to read it, right? Yeah, I restarted. I got to. <laughs> Some page. What a like, miserable I got, existence. I got to like page 50, took a long break. So when I went on the cruise, um, what happened was I went on the cruise, read Catcher in the Rye. I was like, that's awesome. Now let me pound out Children of Dune and then I'll get to Project Hail Mary. Read 88 pages of Children of Dune and I said, can't do it. <laughs> I'll come back to this someday. I need something good right now. I'm bored. I'm stuck on a cruise ship. Nothing to do. I need something good. Started reading Project Hail Mary. And I said, "Man, we are back. This is crazy." <laughs> Welcome home. <laughs> There's never been more of a jump from me being interested. 
Yeah. Than going from Children of Dune to what if Project, Project Hail Mary Dune. isn't even that good of a book, oh, but no. your mind is poisoned from Children of Dune? I know that you think it's like a, a revelation. In I know literature. you're making a joke, but Project Hail Mary's reception is like amazing. Really? Yeah. Most people who read a lot of books say it was their favorite, like one of their favorite books from last year. Which means a lot to like book readers. Yeah. Not to people like us because we only read like a book a year. But yeah. um, if that. Yeah. And people who don't even like science fiction really like it because it's very science and not a ton. There's fiction, you know. There's more m- science than fiction. There's crazy shit, but like it is very scientific. They're talking about fucking amoebas and and cells and shit like it's very scientific oh, so dude, that's awesome if that's your shit then i do like it you're, I you're like in. it. yeah so definitely read that uh pretty gnarly so i guess that's all we have to say it's my number one of the year as of now it's my number five movie of all time i know that's I know. Maybe maybe I'm an idiot. Maybe it comes down in the future. And I'm like, man, I was just that was just recency bias. Where's Dune 1? But as of now, it took Dune 1's place. So now Dune 1's at 6. That's crazy. Yeah. That's It's nuts that Denise just making the best shit of all time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think people grasp the severity of that. Denise will knew right now is making the best shit of all yeah. time, dude. Yeah. People and, call you crazy if you say Denis Villeneuve's better than Stanley Kubrick. But Denis Villeneuve's better than Stanley Kubrick. Yeah, dude. And I'm sorry that that's a hard <clears throat> pill for y'all to swallow, but that's just the way I feel about it. That's just where the cookie crumble, man. I watch a, a Stanley Kubrick movie, and I go, oh, all right, that was good. And I move on. Yeah. I never think about it again. Except for The Shining. Shining's awesome. I yeah. love The Shining. Watch it every year. But I watch a lot of Kubrick movies that, you know, I watch Dr. Strangelove. I'd be all right if I never watched that again in my life. <laughs> yeah. um, Paths of Glory, great movie. I enjoyed it. Probably never going back to it. Even Full Metal Jacket, great movie. Yeah. Never need to watch it again. Denis Villeneuve makes movies that I constantly want to rewatch. Yeah. I agree with you. I do like Full Metal Jacket more than you. Um, like Full Metal Jacket, I like The Shining, and that's pretty much it from. Two thousand one really doesn't do much for me. Two thousand maybe, maybe one just... day I'll grow a brain and I'll understand it and I'll like it, but as of now, that movie's very boring to me. Yeah, it doesn't I doesn't offer re- me much. I respect the hell out, the hell out of it for what it is. Like it's it changed, it changed science fiction, but I never want to touch. I like I don't ever go to my shelf. 2001 yeah you know oh <laughs> yeah so I mean right now Denis has Prisoners both Dunes Arrival and Blade Runner 2049 Sicario and Sicario Cindy. and Cindy the guy's a fucking madman. Yep. I would take any of those movies and he's 56 yeah he has we can we can hope if, let's say he stops working when he's 85. Like, I I think Scorsese's older than that. I think he's like 90 or something. I don't know. Let me see how old Scorsese is. That's a pretty good, like, timetable for how long Denis can work. Um, I know. I feel like Scorsese's he's got a lot of, older than most directors before they retire. Scorsese is 81. So, we'll just say Denis can work till he's 85. Yeah. 30 more years of this. God dang, dude. I mean, it, what did we do? <laughs> what did we dude, do? Dude, we could have been born a... back during the bubonic plague. Yeah. We could have been born before America was discovered. Dude, I could have I could be a fucking I could be swapping a poop deck right now. Yeah. I could be rubbing two sticks together in some cave. <laughs> yeah. This is crazy. Like we hit the lottery. We're living at the same time. As Denis Villeneuve. And Christopher Nolan. And Christopher Nolan. Yeah. We didn't have to go fucking skedaddle our way to the theater and watch Charlie Chaplin movies. Yeah, dude. I, 
Let me tell you something, see? I started a movie, but I fell asleep. I started The Sisters Brothers mm. with Joaquin Phoenix and, and uh, John C. Riley, And it's a Western, but they walk into the store, and John C. Riley's like, what's this? And he's like, it's called a toothbrush. And you see John C. Riley reading the instructions for brushing his teeth. We could have been born then. Yeah. People were walking around with stank breath. Yeah. And fucking shit in their hands. People ass. didn't have medicine. They didn't know what medicine <laughs> yeah, was. They if you got if you got sick, you just died. Yeah. If you got bit you by just a dead spider, now. they're like, fuck, dude. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> oh, your body fights. Here's your off will. Uh, will you go ahead and write everything out? <laughs> yeah. I don't even think they had wills. It was just like, fuck. Jeff died. <laughs> they take his stuff. They show up to work. Oh yeah, Randy died. I don't know. Like, ah, I wanted that wagon. Third one this week. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we could have been born back then. Yeah. But instead, we're witnessing this. It's... What made us so lucky? What What did us two jerk-offs do to get so lucky? Maybe we're just really cool. Maybe that's what... Maybe that's the point here. Or... Maybe all of us... All of us fellas on the planet right now are just cool fellas. Yeah. And we just deserve to watch Denis Villeneuve work. Or this is all part of his plan. This is all part of his mind control game. Yeah, to get us all erect at once and destroy the world. Yeah. He's he's going to put a chum bucket hat on us pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, anyways, <laughs> we're, we're yapping. Um, long episode today, fellas. That's what happens. Um, you, when you, you drop, shake me you drop a masterpiece fork. in front of me and my penis gets hard, I'm sorry. Yeah. This is just what happens. When you shake me to my core... I'm going to do some yapping, dude. I'm going to yap, and you're going to deal with it. That's what's going to happen. Mama! <laughs> the Baron wants to make me bald. Some, some chucklehead named Juan D wants to take it from me. <laughs> All right. We'll see you next week on The Scoop. We'll be back to our regular schedule. What are we going to talk about? Don't know. We'll probably Dune 2 again. Probably just do another ep. We'll do Dune 2 Part 2. <laughs> That'd be Dune, fucking Dune crazy. 2 Part 2 Part 2. Dune 2, The Refresher. Dune 2, Collision Course. <laughs> Dune 2, The After Party. <laughs> Dune 2, Revenge of the Stinkers. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll think of something. Kung yeah. Fu Panda 4 is out. Might dabble. Might dabble. May, may watch something good at home. Maybe continue <laughs> our Michael Mann binge. Yeah. That's what we need to That's fucking do. probably what do. we should do. Yeah. Stop fucking around watching The Insider. <laughs> we should probably be responsible adults and finish yeah, Michael finish our binge. Movies. Hey, we had a cruise. <coughs> you know? It That's happens. True. Um, we'll see you all next week. Thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, on the film scoop. Film scoop.